Okay, so uh, as I said, final session, and we're going to do chapters uh, nine through eleven. Um, so the usual things about um, uh, did you manage to do the reading? Um, any uh, awareness of these people before? That includes Augustine, um, uh, Pseudo Dionysus, and uh, John Scott. Um, uh, we'll get to first impressions after that, I think. But um, we can start with Chuck. Um, um, <clears throat> well, yes, I did finish the readings um, and I have enjoyed the process thereby learning things I did not know um, <clears throat> about uh, some of the authors completely um, new to me. Um, and in particular, um, <clears throat> the Neoplatonist uh, mainstays in this book, but you know even uh, other aspects of people I knew something about. For instance, in in Augustine, uh, uh, or do you use the pronunciation Augustine? I use Augustine, but entirely up to you. No, that's fine. Uh, I normally would use August Augustine. Um, <clears throat> there's a uh, re-establisher of the Roman Church at Can in England at Canterbury, and I think we normally in Episcopalian speak refer to him as Augustine, but I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I have no uh, dog in to, that fight. <laughs> to, to to hear that um, he felt that he had learned Greek with you know terrible pain and suffering was. Uh, quite a surprise to me. I knew he was primarily a theologian in the West, writing in Latin, obviously, but I did not know that his um, learning of Greek was with, I guess, Rulers. savage. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I can understand. I had once very briefly with a fellow student said, well, let's, you know, we, we don't have to enroll in Greek here at the university we can start looking at their textbook. And we gave up after chapter two <laughs> because uh, <clears throat> we, we could not understand what the author was doing. I don't even know if I have that textbook anymore. Uh, it was a very slim volume, but I could sort of begin to get the impression that learning Greek was a very difficult thing to do. Uh, but, <clears throat> The other thing was, uh, for me, also somewhat of a surprise is to have that very brief mention that I think in the 14th century, so the 1300s, uh, a book that was uh, influenced by this entire train of thought is The Cloud of Unknowing, which I had heard of. Right. This, this book, yes. yes that book. We can definitely talk about it. It's a good book. We'll definitely talk about it. It's, it's if, I, if I may, it's kind of a point of contact of the um, Dionysian tradition with uh, elements of Augustine, right? So I think that um, uh, D is kind of making out a kind of strained case of uh, Augustine as a negative theologian when he's primarily not a negative theologian. Um, but she also does mention the uh, the way of love as his response to uh, to um, to that. The title of this is definitely straight pseudo Dionysus, um, and the main understanding I would say is from that. But uh, the author of this, anonymous author of this, uh, has definite sympathies with the Augustinian understanding um, of the way of love, if I can put it that way. Um, we can talk about that. Uh, okay. Uh, other, other people who have influenced by this tradition, I'd say, would be um, uh, Meister Eckhart mm -hmm. in the, and then uh, Nicholas of Cusa. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, especially both of them being influenced by um, uh, Dionysus and, in this case of uh, Nicholas of Cusa, um, John the Scott, um, especially. But uh, out of unknowing is definitely sort of a point of contact of Augustinian and Dionysian, um, more Dionysian, I would say. But uh, but you had heard of the cloud of unknowing, but you hadn't read it. I had not read it. No. <clears throat> okay. But. Um... At the time, and it was a passing reference uh, in my very early studies, um, someone mentioned it and, and pointed it out as a 
uh, worthwhile um, perspective to take about Christian theology. At the, and at the time, I was a very new convert. So yep. uh, it was uh, a sort of side note that I had heard of it. Similarly, um, to know that Dionysius of, uh, of the, the Areopagite um, <clears throat> is not discovered for being not what he proposed himself to be until very late implies to me that all kinds of people would have cited him um, as a reliable source and supposedly a disciple of the Apostle Paul, um, <clears throat> who famously went to Athens on one trip and um, noticed the altar to the unknown God and proceeded to explain to the Athenians um, who the unknown God was as far as they were concerned and who, whom he didn't know. But that reminds me, um, as I recall, uh, the Areopagus was a rise, even a, fo a, a formal hill in the Athenian topography. And it meant, I thought, the Hill of Mars. Is that right? Uh, it's also a court, right? It was one of the uh, higher courts uh, of the Athenian regime, the constitutional regime. It was, uh, uh, you can think of it as being kind of a little bit like a house of lords that has become uh, unimportant for anything except for a few judicial functions um, in, in, their, in their, so their, the assembly was the main power in Athens, but the, but the uh, Areopagus uh, uh, was uh, a sort of higher court um, and uh, the people in it were mostly older families. It had kind of a, a, a religious um, sanctity about it. Many of the um, places where it still had a role in Athenian um, uh, political practice were, you know, uh, concerned with piety of one kind or another. Um, but it was a, it was also a court, right? Um, it was a relatively small body, uh, the order seventy, um, like a senate or like the um, Jewish Council of Elders um, or like the Roman Senate. Um, but it was not of anything like the power of the Roman Senate. It wasn't a, um, a main governing body of Athens. In that sense, it had atrophied to something more like a modern English House of Lords. Um, um, but, uh, but yeah, so all the, all the members of it were thought of as judges and as judges with some kind of um, claim to older families and um, a little bit of an aura of uh, religious sanctity about them. Um, uh, because it was kind of a, uh, a Congress of, uh, you know, traditional piety, so to speak, because that was the kinds of laws they were concerned with, um, not the day-to-day -day governing of Athens, but making sure that the rituals observances were observed and the gods were not offended by any of the public acts of Athens. That was sort of their, their mandate. Um, but, uh, the, Besides the name of the court, it was there was a, a physical seat where they sat, right, right. Um, on a hill. Mm -hmm. um, so, but in that sense, uh, for Dionysius to have had a uh, nickname or a, a further clarification right. well, that he well, was an Ariadne let, guy. Right. Let, let's be clear. So there, there is obviously, um, well, obviously, uh, it's almost universally believed there was an actual historical. Dionysius in Acts, who was one of the early Christian converts in Athens, converted by Paul, um, right. and he's you know considered a saint in several traditions. Um, the pseudo Dionysius part is just that the writings called the Dionysian writings being attributed to him when they were centuries later. But um, so two different people usually called actual Dionysius and pseudo Dionysius. But uh, actual Dionysius, there's no actual writings from right. There's no actual nothing is known about him other than his appearance in Acts, basically. Um, uh, and maybe a few other citations of him from some of the other church fathers, I think, um, uh, I can, can, I'm not remembering what, but there's one of the other church fathers who, who mentions him uh, after Acts in like the second century or something. Um, so there, there, the point is that there is some independent confirmation uh, of his existence and effect on the church there after the time of Acts and after the time of Paul um, from other, another father, but nothing about him being a philosopher there, nothing about, uh, important writings. And the actual writings seem to be from right about 500 AD. Um, they might be as late <clears> as 5, 532. They're certainly, well, almost certainly 
uh, later than 485, just from the kind of uh, topics and references made in them. Um, there's like bits of it that look like uh, pretty close paraphrases of Proclus, for example, um, for thing, and Proclus died in 485. Um, so that's one way in which it's dated with an under. And then there's mm -hmm. some there's some controversies in the church where uh, the authority of one of his letters is cited by one of the parties in the controversy in 532. So that's our over and our under. He has to be around by 532 uh, as, as known writings that people are appealing to. And he, uh, unless he is independently inventing the very phrasing of some of the things that you find in Proclus, <laughs> um, he, he has to be after 485. Um, so anyway, that's that's the the traditional modern understanding of of how to date him, um, but so, at the time, none, none of this was known. And so, giving him the the, the additional now modern uh, appellation of being pseudo Dionysius yes. Yes. is yes. something that only probably begins in the eighteen hundreds or nineteen hundreds. I think uh, there, were people, everybody's, there were people everybody's, who there were some people who suspected it in the Italian Renaissance. Uh -huh. um, uh, uh, Nicholas of Cusa might have had some suspicion of it too. Um, this was around the same time that uh, there were other attempts to probe uh, various uh, documents of the church for historical authenticity. It was one of the things that the Italian humanists were doing. Um, uh, and so there was some suspicion around that time. There were some uh, writings on it that were saying he had to be late by the uh, uh, 1600s. I think a definitive mm -hmm. definitive dating is a is a 19th century thing where they have it all you know all the overs and unders for the reasons I gave but some of the early clues that he was probably not um, as early as he claimed were known by the 1400s I would say um, mm -hmm. but at that time it was not general knowledge it was a suspicion uh, in a few writers um, so fine question. Um, That's all I want to say for now. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so I have a, a question or two. I mean, I, I know that you're familiar with Augustine. Was this your first appearance uh, or acquaintance with uh, Pseudo Dionysus? Um, yes. First acquaintance or uh, knowledge of uh, John the Scot? Yes. Okay. It's interesting so, that those not, sorry, not more, uh, better known, but go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I guess I will add the following comment. It is remarkable to me that the strand of thinking involved in negative theology, um, you know, one could say there is a precursor in the first hypothesis of Parmenides, but, but to realize that um, uh, considerations and speculations and uh, formal uh, theorizing and philosoph philosophizing uh, in this entire area is a fairly consistent strand for a very long time in the West. Um, and I guess I, I'll, I'll go ahead and throw it out. I, um, I'm wondering if you happen to know, Jason, uh, I, I of course was already acquainted with at, at the very outset, the quotation from the Tao Te Ching, the Tao that can be spoken is not the Tao. But do you know where the other comments are? If you encounter the Buddha, kill him. <laughs> uh, you, you mean the other ones from the beginning of the book? At the beginning uh, of the book, yeah. Yeah, uh, too, too, too far afield. Um, if you mean, I pray to God to free me of God. That, that one I know right. is um, Meister Eckhart. Okay. Um, uh, yes, not, not. Not as familiar with the with the the Buddha one. Um, okay. Well, uh, those those are very tantalizing indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so uh, I mean, one of the reasons I'm asking is it's interesting to me which of these things are are, are known sort of in Christian circles generally because Augustine definitely is, right? Yes. Um, I think that something like um, Gregory of Nyssa certainly would be in the East, right? right? Um, where he's you know foundational. Um, uh, is Dionysus well known in the East? Maybe better known than in the West, but still not terribly well known. I don't. I, I think. Um, uh, oh, and then in the case of uh, John the Scot, I think he's extremely little known East and West. The people who know us about him are um, some elements of the mystic tradition in the West. 
um, and maybe some elements of some of the, even the scientific tradition in the West um, for reasons we'll get into. Um, but uh, at the time he was completely accepted in the 800s. Um, some of his propositions were condemned by the Catholic church in 1225. Hmm. So that's, you know, not quite 400 years, 375 years after he wrote, right? So he's fully accepted for close to four centuries, but then there's some of his views which are considered um, heretical in the middle of, uh, you know, peak scholasticism, right? So, um, and at the, from that point on, he is less read or it is more, um, it is more of a fringe thing to read him. So mystics like Nicholas of Cusa do read him, um, but uh, the mainstream does not, so to speak. Um, he uh, uh, resurfaces again in uh, Giornardo Bruno um, is interested in him, but uh, we, we'll come to that when we get to uh, when we get to uh, John. But the it is very interesting to me to see what degree of awareness there is of the different figures in this whole tradition. Um, they definitely are influencing each other, and they're kind of a, a, a definite um, uh, braided tap tapestry at the time, so to speak but only certain threads of that are acceptable to later positions and authorities in ways that continue to focus on them. Um, all right, Craig, you wanna give, uh, did you reading past familiarity with any of these people? Get off, uh, get off mute there. Um, you're yeah, a little, I'm... Craig, you're a little loud. I don't know if you can turn it down slightly. I don't know if I, I know how to turn it down. Okay. Anyway, I uh, did read the softer. material. Yeah, talk softer. That's never been a problem with me. <laughs> That's all. Uh, everybody's always told me to talk louder. So uh, I did read the uh, the material. Uh, had some uh, uh, familiarity with uh, Ariagina and uh, things like um, Celtic Christianity, the Voice of the Eagle, which yeah. is the the homily on uh, on John Saint John. And, and such. So some familiarity with him in terms of the Celtic Christianity, but not a lot of historical tie. Uh, Celtic Christianity kind of tends to be isolationist in some respects. Um, the, uh, the others, I'd been kind of around, I've been exposed to them, but hadn't dug into them that much. Um, so this was kind of new. I did, I did realize I had uh, uh, the writings of Pseudo Dionysius uh, on my shelf, but I, I hadn't gotten around to reading them. But uh, yep. so, did you, so interesting. Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say. Uh, besides reading the chapters on it, did did any of this send you to reading some of that yourself, or? Um, actually, I, I've been yet. so busy with, with too many other projects that I haven't gotten it's, there. But yeah, uh, it's fine. It's fine. I'm just I'm just interested, right? Um, sure. Sorry. It, uh, it, it, it does, uh, it does raise some of the curiosities to me. I found, uh, uh, especially when we got into uh, Dionysius on the darkness, the God the going into the darkness, that was so close to my own personal experiences of uh, the, the, the big mystical experience that I had of submitting to the darkness. Um, but uh, the, the outcome of that, of, of finding the, uh, the experience of, of love and acceptance, at least she didn't go into that. And... Uh, and that's why I, I think uh, going back and reading some other materials, uh, maybe even the cloud of unknowing finally, um, that's been kicking around for 30, 40, 50 years with me, uh, might be the way, the direction to go. But uh, yeah, I, I found like that this was finally getting to some kind of a closure where the uh, the limits of the rationality that she was bringing up were, were found. And then you had to either take... Uh, Dionysius leap into the into the mystical, or uh, or maybe not if you went with Erigenia, uh, Ar Gina. So fascinating areas to look at. Uh, finally, getting used to the way she writes, getting less pissed off when she fails to translate something <laughs> out, out of Latin or Greek or, or, or language she she likes to make, make herself an academic about. But uh, yeah, I found it good. Uh, got through the epilogue, and that was that was like. Uh, a quick denouement more than anything else. It wasn't completely a summary in many respects. Uh, but, yes. Uh, yeah, she just kind of said, well, here an after an afterward, there was an afterthought. <laughs> yeah, and here it is, folks. Yeah, but, uh, that's all, folks. You know, no, please, accept, please accept my dissertation and pass me. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> 
Uh, that's fair. That's fair. It's a characterization. Last one. Uh, I definitely do want to talk about the um, sort of uh, mystical traditions influenced by these folks, um, especially by Dionysus, um, and we can talk about Cladwell in particularly. Um, uh, cool. So, uh, Sam, I know you uh, sometimes uh, just want to lurk, but do you want to give us anything about? Did you were you able to do any of the reading or any awareness of these folks from before? Yeah, sorry, I've uh, actually not been keeping up in the reading with all the other reading I have going on, but uh, I do find a lot of these characters extremely interesting in particular about uh, with regards to their influence on later thinkers. So Nicholas of Cusa and uh, Meister Eckhart you mentioned and Giordano Bruno, which is, yeah, fascinating. You know, he's held up as this martyr of science, but yeah, he also had a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, mystical thinking going on as well. And uh, uh, Newton, <laughs> let's say, dabbled in that area as well. So, yeah, in some ways, my concerns are a little more worldly, basically related to 19th century philosophers and their continuing influence. Uh, on, you know, our own thinking and even more so the kind of oftentimes the rhetorical devices and tropes and the Ur stories uh, that they were tapping into, which uh, to me remain uh, still tremendously influential. So, uh, yeah, well, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get to some That's of that. That's really I mean, what, what I'm coming for. Thanks. Understood. I mean, we'll, we'll get to some of that. I mean, I think that, um, for example, some of the uh, dialectical stuff you get in Dionysus is very reminiscent of people like Hegel and Fichte, um, probably by direct influence, but in the case of Hegel. Um, uh, there's also elements of, um, well, I'd, I'd, I'd say that's probably the biggest. I mean, John the Scott has influence more indirect than that. He's not like a directly copied, but there are, he does have uh, some of these um, uh, notions of a rational primordial unity and uh, different uh, um, uh, intellects having different perspectival views upon that, which is um, um, very reminiscent to some aspects of German idealism. Um, this this guy, um, uh, Dermot Moran, makes the case in this book that um, that John Scott is uh, kind of out of his time, way ahead of his time in a sense, uh, in ways that are closer closer to some aspects of things you get in German idealism, but. Um, if you're if you're interested in that connection, um, uh, uh, that's besides the actual history. Well, uh, quickly, sorry, go ahead. Uh, quickly, yeah, one other thought that just occurred to me while listening to you guys is that Nietzsche was, uh, you know, a classically trained philologist, and uh, he was also very alive to uh, the different ways, perspectival uh, ways of reading, uh, especially ancient texts, uh, for which we have. Uh, we have to basically, you know, kind of use a lot of uh, uh, investigative work, uh, if you will, to try to get a coherent yeah. picture of what was going on. I, so, I, and that I think interesting. I think that's fair, and I think there's a point of contact between uh, uh, how put it some of his reactions to German idealism. But I don't think he was as familiar with these writers as as someone like Hegel was. Um, Honestly, I mean, I think he, he he was classically informed, but he mostly was you know, using it to like read the pre-Socratics. Um, uh, I don't think I don't think he was um, as interested in, in in these folks. Um, I don't you know find him talking about um, uh, Dionysus the, the Areopagite, for example. Uh, the Dionysus he's talking right. about is right. a very different Dionysus. But I just one one other point about Bruno people. Um, you're right that he is often um, sort of in the humanist era or um, later uh, enlightenment era, he is uh, recast as some martyr for science against uh, uh, superstition or something. But he was not only deeply engaged in the sort of um, mystical side of philosophy, he also was a controversialist. Uh, he was happy, you know, uh, he was already um, engaged in fights over the Reformation and Counter Reformation. and um, uh, he was not in that fight um, committed to any principle of tolerance himself. Um, people often project that back onto him. They think that if someone was persecuted, they must be against persecution. Um, <laughs> um, but you can find passages in some of his works where he 
says, you know, we should be open and accepting to uh, all the different denominations of religions except those damn Calvinists. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, there's that's, always that's, the exception. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, he, he really did not like Calvinist uh, predestination thinking at all. Um, but uh, it's a, an aside about Bruno. Um, anyway, that, that, as I said, just an aside. Uh, so Joe, you want to give us uh, your sort of, did you do the reading and do you know these people from before? I think I know the answers, but. <laughs> uh, I didn't do all the reading. Uh, I did it about two weeks ago because uh, with my house situation and my computer going down, I had nothing to do but read all morning. So I had I made a lot of progress on the pages, uh, but it's been two weeks. So therefore my memory is not as fresh as, as uh, more recent finishers of text. Uh, I, of course, had heard of Augustine, but I knew nothing, almost nothing about him. I had not heard of uh, Pseudo Dionysus or John Scott. So I was very interested to fill, to pick those up. Uh, you know, I've always thought there was a huge blank in my knowledge of uh, what went on in philosophy after, after Plato and Aristotle. Uh, I know the Arabs did a lot of, of basically preservation and, and, and some new stuff. But it wasn't until, you know, quite recently, and, and let's say after Kant, after Hegel, that I, I began to pick up more specific information about the philosophers. So I'm glad to have that, that big black gapping window of my knowledge filled in by reading these guys. Even though we're reading them for, for a particular question about how they treated the unknowability of God specifically. <clears throat> but nevertheless, it's very interesting to see how they were going through these gerations uh, my own point of view, which is not germane to anything, is that uh, since we're dealing with uh, a fantasy story, we always have trouble getting it straight. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, in the case of uh, someone like uh, John Scottus, he also thinks he's just thinking about the universe or truth or something like that. Um, but uh, uh, he was accused of being a pantheist, um, <laughs> although he would deny it. Um, but uh, we can get to that when we get to him. But uh, uh, I, I want to just ask a question about the gap stuff. Uh, would, would you say that um, you mentioned uh, like Kant and so forth, but would you, would, what about like the early moderns, people like, um, uh, you know, Descartes and Spinoza and uh, Locke my, and all that my first, stuff? My first awareness actually starts with Descartes. Okay. Uh, yeah. I heard, I knew of Aquinas, of course, and his important yeah. role in, in sort of bringing Aristotle back into what was then the center of, of Western philosophy. Yeah. I knew nothing about the Eastern. Uh, so picking up with, with uh, Descartes, I had a little review uh, of uh, Spinoza. And after him, I sort of passed over um, Leibniz very quickly. Uh, so I yep. didn't know anything about Leibniz. And, you know, I've, I've skipped through uh, Voltaire and the 17th, the 18th century. Yep. Uh, John Locke probably is more, and he, and uh, Hobbes is probably more familiar to me. And then, of course, comes Hume. Uh, after Hume, I was mostly following Adam Smith and, and what went on after that, and very more strictly into uh, economic philosophy. But my friends yeah. always accused me not of being an economist, after all, but <clears throat> of being a philosopher who's interested in economics. And I, I took that as a praise, actually, because <laughs> I was interested very much. Uh, my own point of view on economics starts with the Carl Menger in 18, about 1870. And one of his central claims is that the, the concept of value is, is fundamentally subjective. And that always puzzled me, you know, objective, subjective. So that was, a, I, I explored what that meant. And um, I discovered how frequently in the 20th century work in economics, which I was mostly exposed to, uh, this concept of subjectivity is, is sort of mentioned in passing as a, as, a, as a nod and a smile, and then people jump right into economic statistics as if they were objective. And that makes me want to laugh, especially when they plug them into the computer models and predict the future, which never comes to happen, never comes to pass. So uh, I'm not totally adverse to uh, the modern trend. I want to read. I want to read Popper and Kripke and people like that, basically to, to sort of catch up. But basically, in terms of uh, the history stuff, 
I'm just saying, you know, well, what happened all those centuries? For heaven's sake, they had ideas. What were they talking about? And so I'm very pleased with your lectures. Good. Okay. Sounds good. Um, all right. So uh, I think we've sort of gotten first impressions around, but if anyone else if wanted to give first impressions, they didn't get a chance to get to before we dive into it, um, raise a hand. Go, Craig. Trying to find your mute button. Find my unmute button again. I keep moving it down the screen and it and then it disappears. Uh, the one that uh, that Sam was talking, the other one that kind of came up a little bit that that was just a curiosity as we as I got into Dionysius and and just a little bit of uh, of John uh, of John Scottus uh, was uh, relationship to to Kierkegaard and and the and the leap uh, when you when you have mm -hmm. nothing, nothing, when you don't know what you're leaping into. Uh, so that, that was another uh, tie that I wanted to throw into the discussion for, for, for us to discuss. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, Kierkegaard has his own um, take on um, irrationalism in some of this stuff. Um, uh, and he's heavily influenced by Hegel and his understanding of philosophy. And he has the ideal type of Socrates that he's contrasting to Christianity. Um, uh, so he, but you do also find him making references to things going back to this tradition. The 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 um, the single one probably is uh, um, Climacus, right? He, he he titles some of his books his pseudonyms of Climacus and Anticlimacus, and Climacus was a um, uh, a monk, Eastern monk around you know I don't know 600 700 uh, A.D. who wrote a book called uh, the Ladder of Divine Ascent, which is kind of in these traditions. It's kind of a it's a uh, uh, a self help book for uh, achieving enlightenment, <laughs> um, but it's it's definitely influenced by these traditions. Um, so that's definitely a point of contact. That you, he doesn't really talk too much about Climacus, but the fact that he uses him as a as a pseudonym, uh, sometimes for him and sometimes against him, lets you know that he's read it right and you know took it seriously and so forth. So you, um, it's an obvious place to start with looking for influences here. Um, all right, let's, let, I'm gonna, before we get into the individual things, I wanna talk a little about some of the later things uh, uh, influenced by it. We talked about the cloud of unknowing. Um, uh, the uh, one way to think about that is, by the way, this is a um, book we're talking about. Well, uh, this is a anonymous 1300s um, in the West, that is uh, Latin West um, uh, mystical um, work. Um, so it's, it's a, uh, Advice to a contem uh, to for a contemplative religious life for any any uh, probably a monk uh, some contemplative um, on how to achieve uh, um, such knowledge or union with God as is possible something like that um, and it uses the language the cloud of unknowing which is taken straight from Dionysus um, but uh, it's a it's it's a chatty thing it's a, it's a it's a psychologically informed thing. I, I call, you know, say it's self-help before the letter, um, but it's um, uh, it, it is definitely mystical in its tendency. It is religious practice, um, but it is um, chatty enough that it speaks to um, immediate psychology, right? If I can put it that way, um, in the way that any self-help book would these days. <laughs> um, uh, real, real quick, whose translation are you? Did you hold up? Uh, Good question. Uh, I don't actually know who translated. I mean, uh, the, the edition has a foreword by Evelyn Underhill, but who is a, a turn of the century English mystic. Yeah, um, that was one, one of the translations there. I noticed Ira yep. Prokhorov did a translation and then there's another uh, apparently more modern one that's gotten some good reviews. So I was just curious which yeah. one. This definitely has some archaic language in it. There's no question. Um, it's not right. trying to modernize the language, and that can be a pr problem in reading it. Um, I don't find it that off-putting, but it definitely has archaic language, um, uh, flowery archaic language, not from the time of the translation, but from the time it was originally composed. Um, but uh, it's worth reading. Uh, it is. It's a. It's not a long read. It's not a too challenging a read. Um, we can get into sort of what it actually says later, but. Um, uh, What's the point of that? The point of that is some aspect of this tradition were um, seen as too out there or too heretical or too 
philosophical, too different from sort of mainline positive theology in the, especially uh, uh, Catholic Church in the Latin West um, in the later Middle Ages, but it still influenced um, uh, the mystical tradition in that area, um, the mainline part of the mystical tradition in that area. Um, and they're all clearly influenced by, um, by the language of Dionysus and by some of the things in, in John the Scott, um, as well as by Augustine, who's sort of more mainline. Okay, um, anyway, that's just a little, some of the stuff after. Um, uh, we talked a little about the timings before, but so everyone knows, um, you know, Augustine is contemporary with um, 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 our Gregory of Nyssa in the East, uh, but in the West. Um, we talk, let's talk through that one first. So it's, the, it's the shortest of the three chapters here, and we talked a little bit last time. Uh, she's trying to make out the case that um, uh, Augustine is a negative theologian in this tradition, and I don't think she quite manages to make that case. <laughs> Um, most of the things she cites for that case are um, Augustine uh, arguing for the incorporeality of God or God not being accessible to the senses, not to God being beyond uh, being or beyond reason. Um, the positive conceptions you get of God and Augustine are being and the good and these being equated. She even quotes a passage where um, which she claims is an example of negative theology in uh, Augustine, which is um, almost a pure description of um, just simple Platonism about the idea of the good. This is on page 268, um, uh, where she says, put aside the goods which are good by participation, the good to see the good itself, in which they're good by participation, when you hear this or that good, you also understand the good itself at the same time. If therefore, if you could put aside these goods and perceive the good itself, you would see God. And everything before the last line of that, right? If you just proclaim God, you would see the idea of the good. If you put in that instead, that could just be straight Platonism, right? Not even Neoplatonism, just straight Platonism. Uh, it's just what we mean by an idea. Um, uh, the unifying concept in which the many participate, you could get that in any Platonic dialogue. And nothing that's being said there is um, any truly negative tradition. But she considers this some uh, something like the aphoretic method of Plotinus of taking away things one at a time. That's not what's going on here. He, he's just saying, look at the look at the abstract idea of good in itself, and then he equates that with God. So that's as positive as uh, cataphatic a, a statement as you could possibly hope for. Uh, of a theologian telling you what his idea of God is in positive terms. Um, the next page, a little bit better, there's a little more dialectical, um, good without quality, great without quantity, et cetera, et cetera, on 269. Um, and then certainly in some of the things where he's talking about um, uh, the Trinity and so forth, he does say there are things unknowable about God. And, or, and he also disarmingly in this way that's just very endearing in Augustine says, not that it is, this is incomprehensible, but that I have not managed to comprehend it, right? I'll leave you open the possibility that somebody else will understand it better than he does, uh, which is just his humility. Um, uh, but anyway, all of that is uh, the point where uh, Augustine is sort of agreeing with negative tradition is that uh, there are some aspects of God which are unknowable or mysterious, um, but that in a basically, um, I wouldn't even say Neoplatonist, but in a Platonist uh, way, he's putting together the I am that I am of, uh, of Exodus with the idea of the good in Plato, and he's putting an equal sign between them. And that's the fundamental thing you're getting in the positive theology of Augustine that was so influential in the West. The other thing that she emphasizes, I think correctly, uh, knowledge of God by the via amoris or the way of, uh, of love, uh, starting on page 272, I think that that is also, she's right to characterize this as, as what is um, specific to Augustine. This is what um, Augustine stands out for. Um, and you also find that uh, in the cloud of unknowing, right? It's taken over straight, um, uh, that there's something, uh, what was the point? Uh, the mind cannot know God in this life. Your only access to him is assimilation by love. Right, you can't know him, you can love him. Um, 
that's the that's what you get in Augustine. The other place where there's some similarity there is in Gregory of Nyssa. We have uh, he had he has this notion that you cannot know um, but can see in a mirror. Um, uh, what's and for him the mirror is Jesus. So you you can try to assimilate your soul to Jesus and see and in that see God in Jesus and Jesus in yourself, something like that. Um, by Jesus in yourself, by trying to be like him, right? So that's recommended in Gregory of Nyssa. You find something similar in uh, Augustine, um, where it's just a uh, love of those things. So uh, um, this is inward and upward, right? So um, look away from the things exterior to the things internal and uh, look away from uh, the lowest things, to the highest things um, and love not knowledge as being the, the, the actual way in which progress is made be once you encounter the mystery. So that's what I would say is the point of similarity um, of the doctrines you get in Augustine with what you get in the rest of this tradition and which is also influential on the later mystics the thing that you find in Cloud of Unknowing, for example, that he's not just getting from uh, a Dionysus um, is the, st the stuff that he is getting from Augustine is this uh, via Amorous business, um, which is very much there in the sort of mainline uh, Western uh, mystical tradition. Um, and that's the place where Augustine was the one who had that influence. Now, obviously, he's having that influence because some of that is there in the New Testament, right? And uh, uh, and in Paul, in particular, right? And he's uh, uh, he's not just making that up, so to speak, but he uh, uh, him emphasizing that more than the knowability question um, does have an influence on the whole mystical tradition in the Latin West. Um, so, all that said, I don't think her basic case there that he is primarily a negative theologian can be sustained. Um, she's, he's nothing like Dionysus and he's certainly nothing like Proclus, right? You don't get a kind of Neoplatonic Neo hierarchy here of um, uh, a, a one above being. Instead, you get a good equated with the level of being. The limitation of the, of the knowing of that is, limit, is the inability to understand being itself, right? It's not that, uh, because God is above being and cannot be comprehended. It's because being is too big to be comprehended that the human mind cannot comprehend it. Um, okay, uh, any questions about the Augustine stuff? I realize I'm going through it rather quickly, but that's because we did talk about it some last time. I know that Craig, you had some questions about uh, her treatment of it before. Um, yeah, so you've, kind of, you've kind of covered all those except for one, Okay, which is page 274. Um, in which she, she asserts that Augustine's is a creation-centered theology, uh, pointing silently beyond itself to the unknowable God, uh, and uses, you know, Paul's Roman text for that. Um, that seems to come back up again in, uh, in, the, in the next two chapters, uh, but, I'm, but I'm not sure the difference between the way she's trying to present, or, or Augustine tried to present it, versus the way the other try to present it because that is doesn't go all the way into pantheism but it comes very close to panentheism in the sense that you can look at creation and from there you can uh, extrapolate forward so to speak yeah so the, the the point of similarity here i mean i think in the in the actual uh paul text right it's um it's even more positive than that right it, it's it's like it's supposed to be so up the fingerprints of the creator are so obvious on the creation that you have to be uh, blind or willfully uh, resisting to not see it, right? That's what you get in Paul, right? And I think Augustine is just uh, is just basically, basically agreeing with that and saying, uh, God is invisible because God is uh, above the level of the material, which is not saying above the level of being, um, but uh, uh, is uh, fingerprints visible in the order of creation, something like that. Which you also get in Philo. Um, uh, it's a it's a common idea uh, even before Christianity. Um, uh, so uh, what you get in some of the other negative theologians we'll get later is uh, more like the claim that those things might be known, but God Himself cannot be. Right. So there's there's a sharper distinction between the knowability of creation or the knowability of the acts of God compared to uh, the unknowability of the concept of God or the being of God. 
Um, and you get that in, in both Dionysus and uh, John the Scot. John the Scot is going to go much farther than what you're calling the Panentheist direction. Um, uh, he, he will say, um, uh, if, if, you, uh, if you had a fully enlightened mind uh, in everything that is, you would just see God, right? Um, that the, the 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 fully the fully saved or enlightened soul or the uh, or the angels uh, they 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 look at particulars and they just see the God in it, right? Um, because everything that is only has being because uh, it is participating in, in in being itself. It is that being radiated into it by God. That is the God in it. The essence of everything is the God in it. And so, if you could see uh, uh, theologically, you would see God in everything, right? Um, that's what you get in. In John the Scott, and the fact that you see something else instead is just because of your uh, the limitation of your ability to see intellectually. Um, uh, and he gives the he gives the um, uh, he gives all these analogies from uh, some of which he takes from uh, I think Maximus uh, the Confessor, but um, of physical transformation, right? I'll say you, know, you make iron hot enough that uh, it becomes completely liquid and it seems to be nothing but fire and you have to know rationally that there's still iron left there but it seems to be nothing but fire um, or uh, air with light in it just seems to be nothing but light right um, and uh, the claim is that um, the, the same the same is true of the increasingly enlightened human being uh, body becomes reason or logos um, reason or logos becomes uh, a spirit or mind uh, and spirit or mind becomes God. Um, and the idea is that this is, a, this is a retracing back of what you would think of as the Neoplatonic chain of causation downward, right? That there is uh, be, being radiated, radiated into things, that there is uh, order or intelligence uh, or information, if you want to say structure, uh, radiated in, in, into things, all of those things being the, um, the thought likeness in things. Right. If only if the only thing you see in things is their thought likeness, then all of the, uh, the the material aspect falls away, right? And they become purely thought like. Things considered as purely thought like are part of for John, that's John the Scott, uh, reascending back to the chain of causation by which things subsist, back to being itself. Right, and if you reascend that to being itself, you would see just the God and everything. Um, yeah, which seems to be very New Agey too. That seems to be there. There's a very, I very think strong. That's influence. The other way. That's that's the influence. Uh, the New Ages are, are are getting it from this, not the other way around. Yeah, um, that's what I mean. Yes, yes. Um, so so, um, and you even get in in John uh, a version of this, which. Uh, will say the being in something is the God, the father in it, and the wisdom in something is the God, the son in it, and the, uh, the life in it, or the activity or self motion uh, moving itself in it is, 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 uh, is the Holy Spirit in, in it, right? Um, and you know, the, the, so you, you, yeah, he has the, the different aspects of uh, the thing being more than body, all being radiations into it of the different uh, persons of the Trinity. Um, but this is his seeing God in all things. Um, Okay, so that, that's, I'm, I'm jumping way ahead to what you see in John because of the uh, nature of the question. You don't see all that yet in Augustine, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, Augustine is still making a much sharper distinction between the creator and the creation or um, God and, and man than you uh, get in John the Scott um, for whom uh, man is a microcosm and in the mind of man, all of the things which are, are remade by the same formula and the same components by which God made them originally as the architect of them. So um, always with a, uh, a, a finite in particular take and therefore not as infinite as the original, right? That's why it's microcosm, not macrocosm. But uh, this is very reminiscent of Hegel of that the, that the, that the mind remakes the things as the, uh, as the objective concept has them uh, be in the first place. Um, and that's why you know John the Scot was uh, called a pantheist by those who didn't like him, right? Um, is this uh, uh, if he's he's if he's seeing what is as the as the as the something like the thoughts of God, uh, then the, then the thinking the thinking of them is 
the, the, the human mind recreating as far as it can, right? The, the actual um, structure of subsistence of the architect thought making it, so to speak. Joe, question. Uh, more modern uh, points of view on the same issue has to do, uh, I've heard that one forms a mental image in one's mind of, of something you're thinking about. So if I'm looking at a table, uh, even though I'm seeing the table, uh, I also have forming in my mind at the same time an image of a table yes. behind my optic nerve. Is somehow this what he's talking about? Uh, absolutely, he is talking about this. Um, you, you, you also get that um, in some of the moderns and people like Husserl trying to explain how this happens, but you also found it even in people like Aquinas in, in, in the scholastic time Middle Ages, where they would say that um, uh, the things which, which the mind or the imagination deals are not the things themselves, but the phantasms created uh, from the sense impressions in the mind, right? So you, you, the, the external reality has to impress itself through the senses to some uh, faculty that makes the phantasm and the mind only deals with the phantasm or the internal image that it has of the external reality. That's straight Aquinas, right? And it's part of his psychology. Um, uh, and, you know, you, you, they are definitely, all these thinkers are definitely thinking about those, those, those layers and levels. What's different about them is some of them are thinking about it in more of an epistemological lens and some of them more an ontological lens, right? It's not just the, how do I know something, but the, the rationalist guess about how the machinery actually works, where you can just posit your guess of the structure of it is this way, right? And in, that, in those guesses of the structure this way, all the relations of importance are the mind-like ones, right? The, in modern terms, the way the information is conveyed, not the material. Um, and they're all focused on that, right? For all of them, the, the, if we can put it this way, the informational content is the, is the, is the thing. And that to them is the, um, uh, that's why they're all so Platonist, right? It's because they think those ideas, those ideas are the real things, right? And the, the matter is only a vehicle for expressing them, so to speak. Um, what you get in someone like uh, John the Scott is he will take that farther to um, uh, each mind has only its own um, interpretation slash take on that, its own slice of that infinite uh, informational original. So there's a notion that the, that the, that the original is infinite, right? Um, and that the, the, the finiteness of the thought is only the perspective. It's only, it, there's a, a subjective constructed aspect of the finiteness itself. Whereas in the original unity, there is no distinction. In the original unity, uh, maybe all the distinctions are, 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 are you know, contained in seed or something, but they're also all abolished, right? The original unity of the universe is just the universe. Um, so th that, that's what you get in, 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 in John the Scott, where his highest concept is universe. Um, we're jumping way ahead, but the, 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 uh, th this issue of, um, uh, how they understand infinity or how they understand all that is, uh, is involved in all of it. The, uh, the being theology is kind of the idea that you can think of all of that as just being being, right? Um, and that's, uh, too simple for some of these people. Um, because for the Neoplatonists, uh, the one is beyond being. Um, the original unity is beyond being. Being is a specific distinction. Um, it's too limited uh, to, be the, to be the one. Um, she, D talks about that as being, being, on the, being on the same level as mind and therefore being comprehensible. That's only one of the ways in which this comes up. Um, uh, in John, uh, nature is bigger than being. Nature includes everything, the things which are and the things which are not. Being is only the things that are, which is, which is a proper subset of the things which are and the things which are not. And he'll start off his whole book with the different senses of being in which um, are not has sense. Um, so being is sometimes used only of what is thinkable or sensible in which case the are not is what is not thinkable or not sensible. 
that doesn't mean that it's nothing. Um, uh, or he'll give you um, another sense of being as being means the actual as opposed to the possible. And anything which is possible and not yet is thought of as not being. But it doesn't mean it's completely nothing. Um, and then there's being and, be and not being as same and not the same when you're just talking about distinguishing one thing from another. Um, and then he has the, uh, the notion of being in the uh, platonic understanding where anything which becomes in time isn't really, only the eternal ideas really are. Um, and his fifth one, if we're getting it right, is uh, something about the, uh, the being or not being of the uh, fallen versus the saved soul, uh, it, uh, something like that, um, which may be a, a proper subset of the potential and actual, but it's not clear that it is. Anyway, he, he, so he gives all these different notions of what being and not being could mean in these different equivocal senses to show that in all of these different ways of using the term being, it has a contrary, which is not simply empty. And because there's a contrary that's not simply empty, he'll use the term nature for all, all things, including those which are not. And in that sense, being becomes a proper, a real distinction. It's only a proper subset of the things which are in each of these senses. Okay, so the point that I'm getting at is they are all definitely thinking about this question of what's the highest genus, right? Uh, uh, what's, what's the containing whole? Um, and it is not for all of them the case that the answer is simply being. Um, anyway, those are the kinds of questions they're worried about, which is my response to your, your question, Joe. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to, uh, before we get into um, pseudonymesis, just give a, um, a little bit of a sense of what it's like to read these different folks, right? Um, because we're getting all these trend, you know, um, through the lens of D in her words, and she's got this very specific uh, focus on the negative theology question. Um, but each of these writers, if you read the originals, has their own sort of sense and character. Um, and the sense and character of uh, pseudodionysis is um, it's very much of a sort of systematic philosopher and theologian. Um, he's dialectical. He'll, he'll be hard to read because he's laying out seeming contradictions on every page. You know, the single sentence will say A and not A, you know, uh, over and over again uh, with different, different A's substituted. And in that sense, he can be as hard to read or understand as a Fichte or a Hegel, because there seem to be contradictions on every page. Um, but despite that, if you if you read him sort of neoplatonically and, and understand what, he, what he's doing with all of those dialectical distinctions, he is comprehensible. I won't say clear, but he is comprehensible. He has a definite, specific view that reconciles all the seeming oppositions that he's laying out. And that view is very much a Neoplatonic one. It's a Neoplatonic hierarchy. Um, and uh, it's not just a metaphysics, it's not just a, a hierarchy, it's also a, a sort of um, praxis or, or a set of recommendations for learning about these things, for what you can understand and how far reason takes you and how far you have to, what you have to do when you get to the point where reason breaks, so to speak. Um, but, uh, the point is, he, he reads like a mystical theologian, but he is comprehensibly systematic. He is not nearly as chatty, if I can put it this way, as Gregory of Nyssa. He doesn't read like a, Gregory of Nyssa re reads like a church father who is um, preaching to you uh, about, you know, the, the, the right things to uh, think or believe or the right answer to certain questions, who will occasionally get philosophic, occasionally bring up a philosophical question. That's not the way Pseudo-Dionysus reads at all. It's systematic treatise laying out the things you should know and the order you should know them. Um, and he has this um, across multiple works. He'll have a longer work on a more superficial topic and then a shorter work on a, in, in a more concentrated way. And then a still shorter one on the most concentrated thing. And as you get higher up a hierarchy, the amount of words gets less and less and the formulations get more and more terse, right? And he's very conscious of this and he explains it as a method. He says, when you get to the highest thing, you should be, you know, silence, right? 
the, the, the closer you are to the peak of the hierarchy, the less there is to say, and the more compact, terse, and, and enigmatic it is, to, it is said. Um, and he writes that way, right? He, he's, he's got that view and then he systematically puts it into practice. Um, so the, 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 uh, the treatise on the divine names is more um, prolox than the mystical theology, right? And, and, and so on, you get these successive waves of concentration um, but okay, that's just in, in impressions in reading him. Um, what's the actual hierarchy? The actual hierarchy is one we're familiar with from Neoplatonism. There is a there is an original one that is uh, beyond being. It might be equated with good, but it's not simply good. It is always you know uh, more than good, um, hyper hyper good, uh, uh, and. Uh, Hyperessential is the word you hear everywhere, but hyperessential is just um, badly not translating beyond being, right? Um, he's very much going with the beyond being that we got in uh, original Plato in exactly the same way that Proclus, sorry, that uh, Plotinus understood it. There's elements of him that get Proclean, but mostly he's Plotinian, honest, honestly. Um, okay. And then there's one characteristic, um, one characteristic. Um, teaching of his, which is when you get to the trying to understand uh, uh, the, the, the original one that is beyond being, language will break. You will not be able to understand it with language because language and thought works by distinction and the distinctions are disappearing on you. This is the same reason why that the original um, uh, Parmenides, you know, worked by this aporia, this, you know, seeming contradiction, right? Um, the same thing is happening here. And he calls all that the cloud of unknowing. He's the originator of that term. Um, and uh, so you, you phrases like um, darkness hides in light, right? There is an actual underlying darkness, but it's hidden by light. And by light, understand here being. Right? There is a there is a, a, a light that the that beings emit about what they are, which is hiding the darkness from which they are emerging. There is an original background darkness from which beings emerge that is hidden by the shining of the beings themselves. This is a kind of very uh, Heideggerian language, in fact. Um, and uh, uh, so the darkness is hiding in the light, right? Um, you have to look away from the light to see the darkness, right? That darkness is a dark cloud. It is that dark cloud in which the original unity hides. So the original unity is, is, is uh, the darkness of the original unity of the mystery is the hiding place of the original unity of the one, right? So all, all this language, which is about uh, uh, mystery, the unknown, the hidden um, uh, 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 darkness, right? It's a very evocative imagery um, that you would find that uh, has lots of echoes in, in modern stuff in Heidegger that has, um, uh, but okay, and it also has lots of echoes in later mysticism, right? So what what is the what is the recommendation about this uh, uh, this uh, cloud of darkness in which God hides? The answer is to uh, throw yourself into it. What does that mean? It means to strip away every every uh, conscious particular or distinct thought, and this will bring you to the place where God is. You're not going to understand God, but you can go to the place where God is by, by uh, throwing yourself into the darkness of unknowing. You have to give up trying to know. You have to accept unknowing. And he calls this throwing yourself into the cloud of unknowing. Um, and the claim is that um, there is a mystical unity with God that can occur in that darkness because that unformed infinite undetermined is the original unity. And you cannot understand it, but you can become like it by embracing unknowing. So that's, that's, the, that's the mystical aspect of pseudo-Dionysus. It's a very clear, exposition of a very Neoplatonic Plotnian hierarchy and a practice associated with it of uh, 
how to go into the, the unknowing, the darkness behind being from which the, be the particular beings emerge, mentally speaking, and then to give up thinking that thought is gonna take you any further. At that point, you have to not think God, you have to be instead of think, be in unknowing. Anyway, that's, that's the, the, the mystical ascent aspect of Dionysus. I think it's very faithful to the plot in the original. I think when earlier she was talking about, you know, uh, Plotinus describing anyone who has been there will know, right? This is the same experience. Um, and Dionysus is giving you more of the steps involved, so to speak, um, and is laying it out more cogently, if I can put it that way. But it's the same mystical teaching as Plotinus. It's not, it's not new in that regard. Okay, that's just a uh, first take on what's in, in Pseudo Dionysus. Um, we can get into lots of the things of you know, influences on him and uh, his later influences, the differentiation into uh, divine names, mystical. Uh, theology, his other notions of theology, et cetera. But uh, I wanna to pause to give people a chance to react to this thing I just said, questions or comments. Joe first. Uh, yeah, I was just puzzling. Uh, we know that he was actually a later writer, but he pretended to be an earlier writer uh, because he seemed to know too much about Proclus to be earlier than Proclus. Well, to uh, be clear, to be clear, we don't quite know that he pretended, right? Okay. What we know is that uh, uh, the writings were called uh, uh, Dionys you know, uh, Dionysian writings. They were the right. They were thought to be the teachings of Dionysus the Areopagite. We don't know if the first person who wrote it down that way made that a conscious literary conceit at the start of the work because he wanted to explain the relationship between the unknown god of Acts and uh, and 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 Christianity and Greek philosophy, or if it was a actual backdating to um, grab apostolic authority for a teaching that wasn't apostolic. We don't know. I apologize for attributing motive to his right. name. Right, right, right. Uh, but the point is that he did uh, obviously come after Proclus because he seems to have done a very, very good job. I was impressed by the whole chapter because I like to see the whole thing sort of brought together in a system. Yes, he's a uh, system. Earlier, now, was he prior to Proclus or, or uh, no. after Proclus? It, he's after Proclus. I mean, mo most of the actual system in him is more Plotnian than Proclian, right? So, I know. I know. So, so that, which, means he, which means he has a couple hundred years to have in, 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 imbibed all of his and understood all of his Plotinus. But there are, when, when people date him, they assume that he has to be after Proclus because there are some things, some passages in him which seem so close to Proclus that they think that he had to have read Proclus to have written this. But right. understand that that's not, that's not um, the evidence <clears throat> is, is in the direction of because this thing looks so Proclian, therefore people assume he has to be after 485 when Proclus dies. Um, that's the only direction of the causation. We don't independently know that he was um, after Proclus. We, we, assume that he was after Proclus because some things in him seem like they're lifted from Proclus. Yeah. Okay. Well, my comment was that I was uh, appreciating how systematic he was presenting everything and yeah. he had it all worked out very nicely. The other thing that's noticeable though is Proclus in his own day and time is strongly fighting against Christianity. He thinks of himself as systematizing ancient philosophy into a pagan consensus that he can use to oppose the innovation of Christianity. And he gets into, you know, uh, you know strong uh, polemic fights with people like John Philipponis, mm -hmm. right? Precisely because he's not accepting Christianity. And he's claiming that the, um, the supposed understandings of the highest things that comes from Christianity was already there in our uh, ancient pagan traditions, right? Um, we already got that to the extent that it's true, and to the extent that we didn't already have that, it's because it's not true, right? That's sort of Proclus's official position. And what's noticeable is um, uh, Pseudo Dionysus, it seems to be influenced by him, 
and he is certainly putting together many of the same traditions, but he is definitely coming out in a, in a pro-Christian place, right? He will, you know, he will um, read uh, notions of the Trinity into the same into the same sort of doctrine in much the way, same way we saw precursors of in, in, in Plotinus for that matter. But he's he's not anti-Christian. Plotinus mm -hmm. is too is too early to be anti-Christian. Proclus is not. Proclus is anti-Christian. So Dionysus is not anti-Christian. So if if anyone thought that Proclian Neoplatonism was incompatible with Christianity, um, Pseudo Dionysus is the counterexample. Right? He sees no incompatibility between them, and he puts them together into a system that is at least as systematic as the Proclian system, um, if terser. Okay, good questions. Um, Chuck, any reactions slash questions about where we are so far on pseudodionysis? I, I do have some questions uh, as you have uh, very, uh, I think, well elucidated and further described the situation of the writings of Dionysus. Dion, Dionysus. Um, and as, as often the case, I, I have these detailed little niggly questions to ask. Sure. Um, in this case, in this case, uh, <clears throat> the Neoplatonic uh, writings um, would have been in Greek and would have survived in the Eastern Empire very well all the way through. Um, and then of course, assumed potentially new and, and greater prominence with the falling away of Latin in the East by the time of the reign of the Emperor Justinian. I, I'm wondering in terms of the timing for Pseudo Dionysius, um, if his writing was all in Greek and if his writings were um, well publicized, um, were scrutinized by uh, Christian theologians in the East, is that uh, a different or a separate tradition that can be traced. Um, I mean, we happen because of Dee's book to be putting him in the context of negative theology, okay? Um, and she does very, think, I think very well describe how that is a continuous and uh, rich strata strain uh, that is in Christianity and has pre-Christian roots. But I'm wondering, uh, in, in the case of Pseudo Dionysius, especially if he's um, being thought of in the in the 400s and 500s, uh, late 400s and early 500s, uh, what happens to his writings in the Greek? I'm assuming in the centuries that follow in Byzantium. So, so the answer is uh, uh, he's um, cited in controversy, um, especially the monophysic. Uh, controversies by like 532 AD. Um, that's one of the first times we see things exterior to the Dionysian texts themselves that are referring to them, um, seeking some authority from them. Um, and then uh, later people like uh, Maximus the Confessor um, in like born 580 writing in the, six, in the 600s um, makes strong reference to him and the rest of the Neoplatonic tradition. So. Um, uh, by that time, it is a scrutinized and, uh, you know, influential body of, of theology, right? Um, uh, so, uh, and then uh, he is translated into the Latin West by John the Scot in the 800s, right? Uh, the, the, the first, the first um, manuscripts, uh, I think it's uh, Louis the Pious, requests manuscripts to be sent to him by the emperor, uh, uh, Eastern Roman emperor. Um, and the first translation is made of them not very well by someone who knows Greek, but doesn't know the philosophy. And so he hashes the translation. And then, so they asked John the Scott to make a, a better translation because he understands the philosophy that's being discussed. Um, but that's how he gets, that is how, how Dionysian texts get into the Latin West is through John the Scott in the 800s. So by the, by the 600s, they're being considered seriously in the East. By the 800s, they're being considered, considered seriously in the West. The first time they're actually cited in, in sort of church controversy is in the, in the East in 532 AD. Um, so that's sort of the, 
it's a time span of impact. Um, uh, they're not thought of as uh, uh, heretical in the in in the East in the 600s. They're being cited as you know uh, important points of continuity with the tradition of Neoplatonism, um, but also in, important for understanding Christian theology, especially all the fights over um, Christology and the Trinity and and uh, one nature or uh, two natures, many natures, whatever. All all of that fight that's going on in, in um, Eastern Byzantine the theology at that time by 600 is, is citing him, right? is using him. Um, in, in the West, uh, the reception goes through uh, John Scott, as I mentioned. Um, he's being cited uh, mostly in the mystical tradition in the West. Some Many aspects of him are just not understood in the West, I think it's fair to say. The same happens to John the Scott, he's you know, cited occasionally for certain of his divisions or certain of his understandings, but not really understood terribly well. And that goes on for about 350 years in the West. By uh, the high middle ages in the West, um, uh, John the Scott is being condemned for uh, things which would seem to us obscure. Uh, uh, what is his take on the, beat, on, on the, uh, the beatific visions, right? Uh, that is when, when will, when will the, when will the, Will, will the saved see God, and if so, how or when, right? And that becomes controversy and controversial subjects in um, the scholastics in the West and John the Scots' positions on it. 350 years later, are found to not be orthodox, and so he's uh, mm -hmm. some of his propositions are condemned, and he's not read much after that, except by peripheral figures. Um, he is read by peripheral figures. Uh, up to that time, around the time that's happening, he's read by people um, right across that join, like um, uh, uh, the Robert uh, uh, Grossa Testa, who's like one of the first um, doctors at Oxford. Um, and he's read by uh, um, Albert the Great, teacher of Aquinas. Um, but after that comes some condemnation and he's you know, downplayed. I'm talking about John the Scott here. Uh, Pseudo Dionysus is still being read at that period of time, um, but considered difficult, not known how orthodox he is. Um, so, and then uh, starting with the Renaissance humanists come the first intimations of this might not be apostolic, right? Um, and uh, uh, less and less reliance upon him in the Latin West after that, especially by the 19th century. There are still people in the Eastern church for whom he is important enough that they will contest whether or not he was actually the apostolic Dionysus, the Areopagate, right? And, and all of these, you know, the, the, the scholarly consensus is definitely that he's, you know, 500 AD at the earliest, right? But there'll be still some Eastern church uh, uh, types who will say, no, no, you can't, you can't uh, date him like that. He was, he was apostolic, of course, because he's so, enlightened, he must've gotten this from Paul, right? Um, but uh, that's not taken terribly seriously, but I'm, I'm just pointing out that he's grafted enough into the main line of, of Eastern Orthodox um, theology that there's some people that would be pained at having to remove him. Um, and I don't know, they <laughs> think, that, think that they would have to remove him if he was, if they accept that he's like dated. Most of them don't, but some of them do because it bothers them, whatever. Um, so I would say that, uh, Dionysus has remained influential in Eastern Orthodox uh, Christian theology down to the present day. And I've explained his you know, influence for 400 or so years through John the Scott in the Latin West. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah, good, excellent historical question. Um, I mean, to me, all these questions of influence are, they're definitely interesting. They're slightly less interesting than the content of the ideas themselves, right? Um, because to me, if the contents of the ideas themselves are impressive enough or interesting enough, they will have impact even indirectly, uh, even if someone isn't reading the, that original, right? Um, a nucleus of Kuzu will come along and read him and you know, come up with his own things and he'll influence somebody else. Um, uh, and then you'll find that uh, Descartes is a fan of Nicholas of Cusa. so. Uh, Dionysus has influenced John the Scott, who has influenced Nicholas of Cusa, who has influenced Descartes. So Descartes has been influenced by Dionysus, right? just very indirectly. Um, 
uh, if the idea has enough impact, you'll find it um, in John the Scott and in Spinoza, right? Through a train like that. Just because the thought itself is attractive enough to a mind like Spinoza's, he'll go back to it. Um, and then in that sense, um, there's just a few touches on Meister Eckhart in this book. And, uh, you know, there's just that one, for me, tantalizing reference to the cloud of the known. And so I, I guess I would say in uh, at least the, the West at this point in time, um, uh, the Anglophone West, especially, rather than the continental or the Germanic aspects of the West. Yeah. Um, what would you? How would you assess the the notions of negative theology? Um, are are they? Um, do they have a new life to them? Uh, in part because of mysticism, in part because of New Age in part because of ecumenical considerations that bring in Buddhism or uh, Hinduism into the West? Uh, so yes to all of those. Uh, and the ecumenical you can throw in, you know, uh, seeming connections to uh, um, uh, mystical Judaism. Um, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's Maimonides connections, there's uh, connections to uh, Kabbalah. Um, uh, so there, there's all kinds of, things which have given it new cachet, but the, the most historically grounded of those is simply its influence on the, on the mystical tradition in the, in the Christian West, right? The, you know, people like Master Eckhart and people like the author of The Cloud of Unknowing, um, people like Nicholas Okuza, right? Just had direct influence on the mystical tradition in, in the uh, uh, Christian West and that itself has influences on all these other things. Um, so we talk about Master Eckhart, we haven't mentioned him very much. I mean, his, his fundamental, he, he's definitely influenced by Dionysus, especially um, directly, uh, more so even than John the Scott, although influenced by both of them, I would say. Um, but uh, he's, uh, uh, his fundamental idea is of God as truth um, and truth understood as a kind of infinite truth, right? There is an, there is an infinite truth that is God and uh, the beings are, are the, the truth about beings is their position in that divine truth, something like that. Um, but uh, so in a way that's simplifying the kind of hierarchy that you get in the Neoplatonists like uh, Dionysus or like uh, Plotinus for that matter, he's, he's collapsed the level, the top level of the hierarchy down to the, the truth level, so to speak. But truth as being as one as, uh, 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 unknowable in some sense, because too infinite to be known is the kind of notion of God you get in Meister Eckhart. And that was just immensely influential, influential in German mysticism, um, in the kind of, uh, it, it passed into the quietest traditions. Um, uh, Quakers, right? All those uh, have been influenced by Meister Eckhart's ideas. Um, the influence Protestantism for the notion of uh, uh, direct approach to God personally without an intermediary of uh, uh, church hierarchy or uh, book, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a way in which Meister Eckhart passed through uh, to um, certain kinds of Protestantism, um, especially the quietest traditions. But uh, so, I mean, all of those forms of influence occur for the reasons you say. and of these mystical traditions specifically, negative theology, even more so than that, there's some people that are being interested in negative theology for um, just it seeming to be a more rationalist understanding than uh, uh, the ones which are easy prey for the ideologies of the 19th and 20th centuries, the secular ideologies of the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, which really aren't grappling with anything this deep. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, none of their blows land, so to speak. So in, in that sense, there's a, a revival of the interest in it, just as seeming to be something that, the, that, that a modern opposition um, never dreamed of, didn't know about, therefore didn't aim at, therefore missed, <laughs> right? So I think that's a, in a matter of, of, of pure controversial uh, aspects, that's another reason for its vogue in the 20th century.
uh, and, 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 and these days. Um, is that also latched onto by some of the new age uses of it? Possibly. Um, I don't really know them well enough um, to say, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised. Further on that, or are we, should we go to Craig? Okay. We're not going to Craig. You have nothing to say on Dionysus? I'm good. <clears throat> You're good. Okay. Um, did we, did you, uh, the, the different affirmative, symbolic, uh, and mystical theologies, were, were all of these um, comprehensible? She, she goes through some of them rather quickly. This is, I'm looking at 286 uh, into 292, um, where there's, um, you get a sort of positive theology of the divine names, then you get, uh, which is really translates into symbolic, right? So you have positive, which doesn't get very far, symbolic, which gets farther. And then after that, uh, you have a, a negative theology that ends in a mystical theology. Was that progression in Dionysus clear? Why, I mean, all four of them? I realize it gets quite complicated, but do we understand why they're all four of them? One area that I had some trouble with is what was when she started talking 289 when she talked about the Trinity and the yes. problem with, with, uh, with the one, the three. And, uh, and it sounds like if Dionysus would have maintained his, his uh, status within Christianity, that, that the way she kind of presents his problem with the, with the Trinity may not have been as positive to the other, the other people within Christianity. So I struggle with right. that one. Right. So I mean, it's it's fair to say that the 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 I put it this way: the controversialists about the Trinity, the the Eunomiuses and the Gregories of Nyssa, right? They have how to put it. Uh, there is an attempt to come out on a on a compromise formula that is supposed to be an explanation of the Trinity that is spoken of in terms of being, right? It's usia, right? Uh, the usia is what is in common, the person is what is different, but that means that there's a, uh, a being that is supposedly fully understood and known to be <clears throat> the same. We talked about this a little bit last time of Gregory being backed into the paradoxical situation of saying, you know, the being of anything un is unknowable, the being of God is doubly unknowable, and there's only one correct understanding of it, and you're a heretic if you don't understand it, right? Um, this thing which cannot be understood rationally. Um, now for Gregory, that's not too much of a problem because you're supposed to understand it from authority, right? Not from reason. But there's none of that in Dionysus. For Dionysus, it has to be in reason. And his basic understanding of uh, the level of God is going to be at a level of un not understandable, but uh, the level of being is a lower, level lower than that that is understandable. And this is going to create problems for the usual, put it this way, the usual compromise formula on the Trinity he's going to wind up claiming that being is less knowable here. Um, I think that he, uh, someone like uh, John actually gets into more trouble than this than Dionysus does because Dionysus easily hides in unknowability, if I can put it this way. He's going to claim so much unknowability that having a little bit of unknowability about the Trinity is not gonna be a, uh, is not gonna be a problem. He's not going to stand out for that. He's just going to claim that um, of course, the human being, uh, the human mind does not understand this because the human uh, mind does not understand uh, God. The place where he would have more trouble is if is any places where the traditional orthodoxy is trying to claim more knowability for these things than he, uh, um, mystical platonically, would be inclined to admit or accept. That's why when John the Scot got into trouble in 1225 was about uh, claims about the beatific vision, right? What the, what the saved will see of God, right? Um, and uh, uh, John's position on that was even the angels only see theophanies. They only see uh, uh, surface appearances uh, about God. And that was like not enough in 1225 uh, when, when they were having controversies about it to count as orthodox. But, at the time when they're just having debates over the persons of the Trinity, to, to just, uh, as long as he's not going to make some positive statement about 
uh, God the Father being first completely prior to and more incomprehensible than, uh, than the Son, he's not going to get into trouble with them. And he doesn't for that very reason. Whereas someone like a Eunomius does, right? Eunomius is trying to say God the Father is stri strictly prior to uh, uh, the second person of the Trinity um, and is going to you know, try to poke holes in any orthodoxy that puts too strong an equal sign between them. Um, in uh, Dionysus, none of the equal signs between, between things hold up anyway, right? They're all, all overturned by the end of the sentence. So uh, he doesn't get into trouble. Now that does put, get D into some trouble trying to explain what his position is on it because you know, uh, what his actual position on it is something like it's purely in the level of the symbolic. And you could see him that getting into trouble with orthodoxy in some things because for him, the mystical theology is deeper than the symbolic theology, right? And all of the symbolic theology is always a adaptation to human understandings, limited perspective, um, uh, to speak Maimonides, you know, the Torah is, you know, is written in the tongues of men, right? Uh, that's sort of his position on the whole symbolic theology compared to the mystical theology. And the mystical theology is not primarily about the Trinity. The divine name stuff, the Trinity stuff is all in the symbolic theology, right? Um, I don't know if that helps, but the, the, the fundamental point is that Dionysus isn't hanging his hat on a particular reading of the Trinity. It's not what's important to him. For him, that's part of the symbolic theology. The symbolic theology and the sim entire symbolic theology level is the names of God's level where everything is only um, metaphorically predicated of God, right? And after that, you go through the negative predication, and after that, you get to the mystical uh, uh, unknowing business. And so he's already left the plane at which the uh, Trinity controversy happens by the time he gets to all the parts he actually cares about. Now, that might be taken as evidence that he's more of a Neoplatonist than he is uh, a fifth century uh, Eastern Christian, because the fifth century Eastern Christians, Christology was like the, the the thing they were all fighting about, right? And he's not fighting about it, but he's fighting about it because for him, it's, it's at the level of the merely symbolic theology. Does that help? Yeah, as long as we don't get to the, uh, <clears throat> the old story of the Catholic priests that I got told, even though I was Protestant growing up is, that's a mystery, my son. Response. Yeah, well, I mean, she, she's very straightforward about this in 289, right? Uh, even the Trinity is a title which must ultimately be understood as falling short of the unknowable Godhead, an idea which can still cause tremors of shock in some theological circles. For Dionysus, God is the unknown oneness beyond the source of all unity. It is for this reason that Di Dionysus also denies the title of one, for God is both one and beyond one, right? So I, I think that uh, for Dionysus, God is closer to being, as he puts, as she puts it, uh, the, the, the unity uh, what does she call it? Um, the unknown oneness beyond the source of all unity. Um, that's closer to being a Plotinian one than anything else, right? Um, but uh, if he had said that uh, God is only one and not three, he would have been in deep trouble. But he said that, you know, God is not three and God is not one is super three and super one, right? Just as, it is, just, it is, just as it is beyond being, it is beyond one. And, and that ver ver verbal formula would mystify the person listening, but it wouldn't uh, positively state the opposite of what the person listening um, sincerely wanted to claim, right? Um, uh, so it's just uh, uh, Lasky succeeds in freeing the Trinity from the bounds of economy. Um, but uh, the names Trinity and Unity are simply names for what is above every name. Um, I think the, the real story there is because the end of his treatise is on names is that uh, all the names are A and not A and beyond A is the answer, 
right, for every possible A that's been cited in the, in the names. Um, and the overall doctrine is that each of the, each of the single term names only points to something about God. It's not uh, actually predicable of God. Um, that saves him from uh, the positive imputation of something which the Orthodox are constrained to deny. But as I said, this whole line, by the time you get to people trying to make positive claims in the 1200s that they positively know as a matter of orthodoxy that the, uh, the saved will see God face to face precisely at this time, right? After their death and before the, before the, before the resurrection specifically, right? You know, uh, and specifically face to face, not through a glass, glass darkly and all these other formulas, then you can easily see that some will say that's incompatible with this. This is too mystical for that. This is not allowing for that. Um, to which, you know, any Dionysian would just respond, okay, your, 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 your little orthodoxy is, is, is the language of the tongues of men for uh, the, those who uh, uh, have to feed on milk and not steak. Um, but we all know that it's just a, uh, uh, a, a verbal approximation for the weak-minded who cannot possibly be expected to, you know, uh, have any philosophical understanding of the peaks of metaphysics or any mystical understanding of God. That's the way that uh, any Dionysian or for that matter, any medieval mystic will respond to those claims. Yeah, he, she kind of picks that up in the, in the last sentence of 291. Uh, it is only the genuine lover of holiness who is led to yes. leave aside the protection, protective covering of the symbol and enter into the simplicity of the divine nature. Knowledge is not for everyone. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and Dionysus presents all of this uh, as, as being a uh, only for the knowing, right? Um, and is careful to leave uh, uh, outs for those for whom this is not suited, so to speak. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, there are some people who would react negatively to the level of, uh, I'll put this way, exclusivity and elitism in that, but uh, uh, precisely because he claims that the final level is not about knowing, um, uh, he's somewhat uh, immunized against that. I think Augustine is even more immunized against that because he will, he or the people, the author of the cloud of unknowing, will not only say that it's not about knowing, but he'll say specifically that the that the method of the final step is love, and that will that will uh, uh, immunize them against another level of criticism of this being too philosophical, intellectual, and not uh, Christian or religious enough, which might be leveled against a Di uh, uh, Dionysus, but can't be leveled against an Augustinian cloud of unknowing author, put it that way. Um, I mean, it's clear to me that this is a more philosophical Christianity than you get in a lot of mainline Christianity. Um, to me, that's not a criticism, but there are people for whom it would be. <laughs> um, okay, uh, are we good on Dionysus? Should we move on to John the Scott? Well, I can always suggest a wild goose chase. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Since, since the divine names is mentioned here, at least in passing, yes. I'm sort of curious to what extent do uh, the divine names um, have a role to play in Islam? And um, was there ever any reference back to Greek philosophy and divine names? The answer is yes, they have a powerful role in Islam. And there's one of the ways in which that happens is because some of this sort of stuff through um, uh, uh, Syrian Christianity and Nestorian Christianity uh, mm -hmm. informed a lot of the tr um, Muslim thinkers who are translating the Greek tradition into Arabic. Mm -hmm. And treatises on the divine names were read in the circle around Al Kindi. Um, influenced Avicenna. Um, Ghazali writes a book on the divine names later that is trying to take issue with some of that, some of that as being too uh, philosophical slash skeptical and not mystical enough, if I can put it that way. Um, it should be more willing to be mystical and inspired. There's 
And then after that, there's a, a longer tradition, I don't know, longer, there's a later tradition um, among some of the Sufis of, uh, I would say, Persia area that are, um, for whom they make it a matter of conscious mysticism, but they, you know, um, think about the divine names. So yes, there is definitely a tradition that passes over from all this stuff through the Nestorians into the sort of Avicenna uh, line of Islam, and then Ghazali takes it in a more mystical direction. Um, I don't know beyond that. I mean, I sort of lose my th my my trail of that thread in the you know uh, the uh, Sufi mystics of Persia in the you know 16 or 1700s or something. It probably lasts longer than that, but I don't know beyond that. <clears throat> Um, and is there any significant distinction between the divine names from Greek philosophy and Islam? Um, there's and certainly tons of overlap. Um, there's certainly tons of overlap. There might be additional names, right? That are an additional thoughts on that, or you know, thoughts that are different on, on some of those names. Uh, they certainly wouldn't have a trinity. <laughs> but if you look at the list on 288, um, <laughs> Trinity is not there, right? It's not in the list that Dionysus is, is thinking about, right? Sun is not one of them. Uh, word is, mm -hmm. um, that's as close as you get. And that's not something that the uh, Islamic tradition, you know, would have to run too far, too far away from. Um, so I think that that, that tradition can be at least, it can be ecumenical at least within the great monotheisms um, and seems to be. Thank you. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Um, not, not too, not too hard, to, not too far a distraction. Um, okay. Uh, By the way, I just want to just uh, quickly on uh, leading Dionysus, she, um, patristic or Neoplatonic, she, she, she asks. And I think the, to me, the answer is very clearly both, right? I mean, uh, Dionysus is a Neoplatonist, but he is also a Christian thinker and he is performed full synthesis here. He has not overridden what he got from Christianity with what he got from Neoplatonism. He's not Proclus, right? Um, Proclus is way more anti-Christian than, than, than Dionysus is. and Dionysus is just showing the synthesis between these two positions as possible. He's an example of showing that the synthesis is possible. He's not unchristian because he's Neoplatonic, uh, as some might think. Um, okay, John Scottus, Yuri Eugenia. Why is he called Yuri Eugenia? Yuri Eugenia just means born in Ireland, basically. And he's, it's just because he signs himself that way. His name is John the Scot, but when the French said the Scot, they meant any of those people from off those islands to the north who are, you know, vaguely Celtic, right? Um, and uh, uh, but he 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 adds the the I'm I'm from Ireland bit because you know apparently people were thinking that he's from a, a colder place farther north. Um, but he, he he's active at the um, first thing to understand is that in this period of the uh, dark ages in the West. There was a very early monastic tradition in Ireland, and there were a lot of learned people coming out of Ireland. Um, uh, there was a lot of learning that survived there, knowledge of languages, texts, et cetera, and especially a tradition of um, you know, uh, learned monastic practice, if I can put it that way. So it, it's not so unusual that a, a French king should reach for an Irish monk uh, if he wants to find someone who is so learned that he knows uh, Greek as well as Latin and philosophy well enough to translate a obscure uh, uh, Greek philosopher uh, into, uh, into Latin. Um, and that's sort of the, the, the job he gets. Um, so um, as she mentioned, uh, Hildewin made the first translation of Dionysus into Latin in the 30s, um, but uh, uh, that was under Louis the Pious. Charles the Bald asked for a new translation because no one can make head or tail of what uh, 
Hilduin is saying because he's just translated the words. He didn't get the thought, right? Uh, and Dionysus is a extremely paradoxical thinker, right? Unless you know a lot of, you know, Platonic theology or Platonic uh, meta, uh, metaphysics, you're going to get everything wrong if you try to translate it. Um, so um, there are some of the uh, little bits of the translation of John Scotus uh, himself that are um, later taken issue with by uh, Robert Grosetesta in the uh, 1200s. Um, they're minor compared to the things that the problems with Hildewing. Um, so basically, his translation was the one that took. Um, and it wasn't until like 400 years later that people said, oh, you got this one word wrong um, in a couple of places. Uh, he did. There are places, a couple of places where uh, it is true that uh, uh, Robert Grosetesta does a better job tr translating uh, with complete accuracy, but he's making very minor corrections to an essentially correct translation. Um, uh, anyway, that's the, the basic point there. And the places where John is interpreting as well as translating are places where he's, you know, uh, making out uh, Dionysus to agree more with he, John, than he might have, right? Um, so he'll translate uh, uh, cosmos as world, um, uh, which means for for John for uh, John that means specifically creation and not universe. So he won't translate cosmos as universe. He'll translate it as world. And you know, uh, and uh, um, Robert Grosetesta is not saying that you have to translate it universe, but he thinks you can translate it as cosmos, or you can just say cosmos. But uh, for for uh, uh, John, that wouldn't be a translation. You have to put it into Mundi. You have to put it into a Latin word that everyone actually understands in Latin, right? You can't just put the Greek word in there and not translate it. Um, as we've seen here, some people do that. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that uh, how 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 accurate. Um, uh, some of the translation terms is, is the issue there. But anyway, the, the basic point is that the first real philosophically informed uh, accurate translation of the ideas of Dionysus into the Latin West came from John the Scot. Um, I wanna talk a little about what it is like to read John the Scot because it doesn't come across in this at all, how different his atmosphere is. If I can put it this way, then Dionysus. Dionysus is a systematic mystic he's you know he's going to give you you know didactic treatise this is the right thing to think about this this is the right thing to think about this you know one after the other and all of them very terse very dialectical very paradoxical difficult doctrine right he, he, he writes like hegel right in that respect um and compared to that john the scott is a chatty guy writing dialogue he has a, 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 a learned master and a, and a, uh, a very uh, compliant student, uh, a very compliant student asking the questions about how do we understand this thing? And he gets a little expository doctrine. And he says, I don't quite get this part. And he'll go into another, another sentence and then he'll, he will easily get it, right? Even if you don't, right? So, but it, it's, it's this, um, it's not a Socratic dialogue kind of form because it's longer responses than that. The closest is some of uh, Augustine's writings that are in dialogue form, like some of uh, Augustine's stuff on uh, uh, doctrines of free will are written in the same kind of chatty dialogue form. Um, but that's the way it's written. And then it's, so it's more conversational in that respect. Um, and then the actual stuff being laid out is, um, feels much more like a uh, scholastic philosopher, feels you know like uh, the, the doctrines could be out of Aristotle, um, you know, they will have a long discussion of do Aristotle's 10 categories apply to uh, uh, things which are, you know, uh, only to things which are created, or do they also apply to the creator? And if not, why not? And, you know, those sorts of things. It's, it, it reads like a philosophy text, um, not like a uh, mystical theologian didactically expounding in Hegelian density, right? It, it, is, it is chattier, more approachable. Um, that doesn't to say that the doctrines don't get hard. They do, right? Uh, and they and they get technical, but it's all presented in a in, in a. I'm gonna put it this way: it's meant to be commonsensical. It's meant to be able to give you a reason for every everything that you are asked to accept, right? Um, and an objection will be made and answered, 
right? Um, so anyway, that's just um, how different John the Scott reads than Dionysus. Dionysus reads, you know, very dense, terse, mystical, and hard to understand, and and John reads uh, much more conversational. Now you still wonder as you're reading John, did I get all the points? Do these points actually cohere with one another? Is this too slippery? Is this incoherent? Did I accept something on page, you know, uh, 14 that I'm uh, repudiating on page 28? Right. You do have to pay attention to those sorts of things reading John. I'm not saying he's a model of um, uh, analytic clarity like a, uh, uh, a a modern Anglo-Saxon philosopher in that respect, um, but. Uh, the other thing to note about him is that he's um, uh, always willing to give you a new system, set of distinctions, way of thinking about the thing, right? So when he'll introduce the notion of being, he'll say, is being the highest genus? No, nature is higher than it because nature includes the things which are not. And here's five different senses of being. And he'll go on for each of them for you know several pages. Um, and, you know, five different senses of being, uh, uh, going through each of the 10 categories and asking, you know, uh, does it or does not apply? There's this systematic uh, treating everything uh, aspect that you get in, in John. Um, okay, so in that sense, he feels like a scholastic, if I can put it that way. Um, okay. Uh, I have to say that some of the stuff here from D is not her best. Right, she she uh, uh, too easily conflates terms that um, John is carefully distinguishing. She'll talk about uh, the divine essence, and then she'll talk about the divine nature, and then she'll talk about uh, the divine as such, and then she'll talk about you know unknowability as such, and she won't be carefully distinguishing these things at all. Whereas John is definitely carefully distinguishing them. And if John says nature, he doesn't mean essence. And if he says essence, he doesn't mean nature. Essence is being and it's a, it's a term of art and he'll use it specifically, right? Um, okay, uh, I, I just, you know, there, there's places there's places where um, D is just not, is just not careful on that. Uh, Right, so she says, you know, uh, in the Paraphysion that is on nature, that's his main work, uh, the divine essence, even when described as the reconciliation of all opposition in the hyperphatic way remains unknowable. Well, yes, the divine essence remains unknowable, but essence is unknowable. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that he, he takes from Gregory. You, you, you know things, here's the point. John is an epistemologically careful thinker who's making distinctions, right? If you're, gonna, if you're able to know something, he wants to know how you know it, right? And something being in the category of knowable is not the same as just saying, you know, anything that is is automatically in the category of knowable. No, there's things which are knowable through the senses. There are things which are beyond the senses but are knowable by pure intellect. Um, we ascribe beings to things which are noble in that way to the extent that our being has access to them. Being is an inscription of a mind, a mind at a level with a certain level of capability, right? Which, which denotes that we have access to it either through senses or through pure intellect. That's what it means to say it's a being in his first sense of being, okay? Do you have exhaustive knowledge of an infinite essence? You cannot. Right? Exhaustive knowledge means knowledge through distinctions. You cannot exhaust infinity. There is no exhaustive knowledge of an infinite essence. Okay, therefore an infinite essence is unknowable. Not only that, he'll start off with a division of everything that, that is, uh, is or is not, sorry, uh, all of nature into um, the created, uh, sorry, uh, that which creates but is not created, that which both creates and is create, uh, both is created and creates that which is created but does not create, and that which is neither created nor creates, right? And the last of those he'll say is not, right? Doesn't have being. Um, uh, it is, the, it is, it's meant to be the, the, the fourth of the categories, but it, it starts off being empty. 
what does he mean by the uh, cre creator that also the creator that is not created? That's God. Everything else is the creation. Um, and then uh, the uh, the other two, there's uh, what is created but does not create, and that's all the actual particulars. What he means by the created and creates is the level of the Platonic ideas, basically. Um, all the all the causal principles of things he puts on the level of they are both made and they make. And the uh, then after he's laid out this whole thing, he, he starts, play, you know, tying these things up in knots. He'll say that in a certain sense, the creator and the uncreated that does not create can be equated with one another. God can be put in the fourth category because there's a sense in which God does not create. Because mm -hmm. simply to create is too specific a term to apply to God. Um, uh, because uh, it is not simply true that God is simply what creates. Otherwise, you would have a, a finite essence of it. And it has to be the unity, unity of all oppositions. So the point is, you, you, you get these typologies, and then you get you know, um, extra propositions that are made by tying these things together for a particular purpose. Um, okay, and, and my point is that I just don't think that she is as careful in distinguishing all of those things as his actual language um, requires. Mm -hmm. There is one fundamental idea that she does get right, the super essential or more than essence, the more than. The particular doctrine that you get in John is that uh, all of the more than predications are negative predications. And I think this is very smart. It's just, it's true, but it's just very smart, right? You, you start from, you can have positive statements, God is good, negative statements, God is not just the good, right? And then you have the, the, the more than statement, God is more than good. And then John will tell you the John is more than good statement may be phrased positively, but in fact, it is a negative statement. It doesn't tell you what God is. It tells you something that God isn't. Right, so God is more than good is the same as saying uh, God is not simply the good. Right, um, and he, you know, he will assimilate the more than statements to the negative statements. He'll say that all the negative statements are more can be more accurately predicated of God than the positive statements. But in all these all these doctrines he's giving you, there's a reason behind them. The reason behind them is he has a clear and distinct uh, conception of God as a kind of original and final unity out of which all things emanate and to which all things return. And the uh, from which and to which in that is not simply in time, right? It's in, you know, principle of subsistence or uh, uh, platonic hierarchy of causation of what depends on what else. Um, and he gets called a pantheist because in all of that, if God is the cause of all, there is some God in all things. Right, um, and the, the levels of those things are, uh, first there's the being of things, then there is the wisdom of things, then there's the life of things. And that is the, those are the aspects of things in which they are more than uh, mere matter, right? Something is more than mere matter if it's alive or if it is wise or if it is, you know, the, the, the being part being more than mere matter is uh, harder for us to get, uh, that is us moderns. Um, but for him to uh, to be is to be more than uh, there's all these ways in which he's distinguished being and not being and it, uh, thinkable accessible to mind is one of them uh, actual as opposed to potential is another of them um, and having some aspect of eternity to it as opposed to just simply be uh, in, embedded in time is another one of them and in that sense to be is not simply He's not, he's not an Aristotelian. He's starting from material particulars. Let's put it that way. When he thinks of something which is material particulars, not the first thing that comes to his mind, right? Um, as something more like eternal structure. And even the material particulars are only instances of, 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 of eternal structure. Okay. Um, but all of this with a, you know, an Aristotelian carefulness about, you know, essence and accident and all the rest of it that you, you know, don't even get in Dionysus, but you would get in a later scholastic like an Aquinas or something like that. Um, okay, <clears throat> the, the point is that there is, a, there is a original unity as the idea of being that radiates being to the beings and as the 
structuring minds that put what's ordered into things as, as there is in them or what information in them there is, um, as well as the, the uh, potential seed of everything that eventually is actual, right? All of this with a uh, platonic uh, idea-like causation, you know, uh, before and therefore outside time, right? Okay, so that's one of the reasons why he, Sometimes it's called a pantheist. It's also one of the reasons why you could see elements of him echoing in Spinoza. Uh, Spinoza's, uh, when I think of Spinoza, I'm thinking of the, um, the uh, Parmenidean block universe of uh, 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 all of history in, in the mind of God as just you know, a, a single structure. Um, that's, that idea is kind of there in, in, in John as well. The extra thing that's there in John, which is only partially there in Spinoza, but is also there in Leibniz, is this notion that individual minds as microcosms only see slices of the divine reality. There are as many such slices of the divine reality as there are saints, he says at one point, right? By saints, he means anyone who under, actually understands God. So he has this perspectival notion of the, um, the finite minds are, are cuts through the infinite of the, of, of the uh, uh, I was about to say of the real, but it's not simply of the real, it's of the, of the beyond being. The beyond being aspect of it is that all of the being that, that is ever actually perceived is the finite mind slice of a particular mind. And the, the full unity is infinite and therefore beyond any of those, right? Okay, so there's an, an infinite original unity of, of all these things. All of this is very much a philosophy, right? It's a philosophy like Spinoza is a philosophy. It's a philosophy like Hegel is a philosophy. Um, he even has the Hegelian notion that um, the human mind recapitulates uh, the actual process of logical, of, of logical and metaphysical construction of anything when it thinks that thing. What do I mean by that? There is, uh, there is some formula for making that particular thing or that particular thing happening in that particular way in the mind of God, in the actual sort of information content of the universe, so to speak. And when a human being understands something correctly, they are simply um, getting that limited aspect correct, right? They are, they are uh, rethinking back those, uh, those thoughts of God. Um, but in all those things, it is always relation and uh, uh, that we actually have access to, whether from sense or from intellect. Uh, so the, the, there is the clothed thing in itself, if you like, but the clothing around it is all of the relations that it enters into, all the aspects that it has, and those are the ways in which it is actually related to consciousness. And the, that is what you actually manage to understand. So without the closing of accidents, you don't understand it. So there's always something, some aspect of the being of the thing, which is hidden, right? You just know that it's there. You don't know what it is, but you know that it is. That is the, uh, the core holder of the cloud of properties, right? So there's a, there's a uh, um, semi-Aristotelian, semi-Kantian uh, uh, entity and accidents doctrine here as well. Anyway, uh, I'm just trying to explain sort of the basic John the Scott philosophy. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, well, I'm sitting here and beginning to wonder, I mean, an example of something that you don't know what it is, but you know what it's not. Uh, one example would be the concept of justice. Now we have a concept of justice, we believe we do, but we can't really know how to lay it out in any possible way, except perhaps by identifying all of the specifics that we can do about what is injustice. So it's a one-sided uh, uh, you know, description. Mm -hmm. And I'm beginning to wonder, are we, are we talking about the same kind of thing here when you talk about God? Uh, because it seems to me that Otherwise, aren't we just trying to solve an equation with some factor in there divided by zero? <laughs> to some degree, yes. Um, uh, so here's the negative. Here's the the the, um, 
the part where it is like what you said about justice, right? They're starting with from they know it is not corporeal, right? Then then they 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 know that if it is an idea or idea like it is not a single limited idea, right? Uh, it's it's uh, at least as big as truth, something like that, right? And so then uh, having arrived that far by negative means, right? They, uh, there are only a, a limited number of candidates left, so to speak, that might be as big as truth. Being might be as big as truth. Truth itself might be as big as truth. Uh, uh, for some of them, uh, the idea of the good might be as big as truth, but that's because they've got this platonic notion that the things having definiteness, uh, definite enough to be a being, is something good or measured about them, something like that. Um, but. So yes, all of them are starting from that. And the question is, how far does that go, right? For, for some of them, it goes very, very far, right? Most of these other being ideas or truth ideas have some aspect, of about, aspect about them, which violates some other negative proposition they have, right? Um, uh, too one-sided to be true of, of unity, something like that too complicated to be simple, right? Whatever, there'll, there'll be different versions of, of what that is in, in, in each of these different thinkers. In the case of um, John, uh, uh, too one-sided to be uh, an original unity is definitely one of them. Um, and that is an acid that will strip away most things, right? Most things will not survive the procedure of asking, is this actually, uh, uh, not, is this actually free of its opposite? Is this actually opposite free, like unity should be? Um, and most things even say good won't have that characteristic. Being won't have that characteristic. So he won't say that uh, God can be equated with being. Um, so, so yes, it is, it is that procedure. The, the, dif the difficulty is that in your case of, of justice and injustice, you think if you stripped away all the concrete injustices you have, that you'll have something left that will count as being tolerably just. There are idealists in the world who will disagree with you, will find everything that actually exists condemnable, right? And they will have a, a notion of justice so high that they will never actually encounter it in this life. And then you will find someone who can denounce as unjust everything that it, it, it exists, right? That's closer to where we're getting here, right? Most of the negative things are so uh, uh, have so many things in them that almost that if not almost everything, perhaps everything, one or the other, uh, is going to end up being excluded. So the thing left is the idea of God might be empty. It might at least be unknowable. Um, it certainly is going to be paradoxical. Um, does that help? You're, you're still on mute. I think you were nodding and saying yes. But... No, well, yeah, as I fish for how to move the mouse to get the, the uh, unmute, but yeah. Yeah, no, that was very good. Thank you very much for explaining, for adding that in. Yeah, okay. Um, so Craig, questions about John the Scott, if any. Oh, one thing that, that I find interesting in terms of your analysis of what Dee did is uh, five years later, she writes a 100-page um, ah. book about him. Yes. Uh, and I'm wondering if uh, she didn't receive a little criticism for what she'd done in this book. And got it better? That's quite possible. That, that she comes out with something better five years later, because this this uh, quick scan of, of course, it's extremely fine print. So. So um, I'm going to have to go digging into this now to see uh, how much she clarifies what she may have said in the in the in the in this section that that didn't quite get there. So so uh, there, there's very interesting little thread there that that says she uh, either was very right. enthralled with him or or she got a little bit of push. She, rea she, she realized she wasn't careful enough with some of her, you know. Uh, the divine essence, the divine nature, you know, she's just being slipshod between which, which one is she's talking about, right? Uh, so it's, now she's going to be careful about it. Yes, that's yeah, believable. It's the, it's the easily a thesis committee saying, well, we'll accept this thesis, but you got to go back and do a, a book on this chapter. So I, I want to just read a, a quick example from John, from John himself to give you a sense of what he's like, okay? So this is a particular, this is the, the 
of the two characters, one's the student, one's the master. This is the master speaking, right? Um, uh, okay. For nous and usia, that is mind and, and being. Uh, it says, for nous and usia, i.e. intellect and essence, signify the loftiest part of our nature, or rather the loftiest motion. Of course, as you understand, the being of our nature is the same as its motion. For its essence is stable motion around God and creation and mobile stability. For while it moves around God who surpasses everything, the highest motion is granted to it. When it turns, however, about the primordial causes, it's like the ideas, which are immediately next after God, it is understood as moving in a middle course. But when it tries to perceive the visible or invisible effects of the primordial causes, that's the created things in the material world, it is discernibly undergoing its lowest motion not because the same substantial motion can be increased or diminished in itself, but because it is judged least moderate or greatest according to the dignity of the things around which it, resol it revolves. In other words, which thing you're thinking about. Thus the essence of our soul is intellect, which presides over the whole, that is the universe, universal of human nature and resolves unknowingly around God above all nature. Reason, logos or power, dynamis, makes its way into what is in effect the second part. And this is reasonable since it is born around the beginnings of things which are first after God. The third part is called by the names of sense, Dionia, and operation, Energeia. It holds uh, what is virtually the lowest place in the human soul and rightly so since it revolves around the visible or indivisible effects of the primordial causes. So he's, he's, he's giving you three human faculties that intellect can do. It can either contemplate the universe it can uh, uh, contemplate the ideas and reason about particular ideas in particular ways, or it can try to understand the material particulars with sense and operation, that is activity, right? And he's going to equate those three levels, spirit, reason, sense, with the uh, universe, the ideas, the sensibles, and with what, can you guess? with the three persons of the Trinity. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, in, it's interesting as we as we hear that when you, when uh, <clears throat> at least what I'm hearing there when he talks about motion and dynamic dynamics or energy and motion, yes. um, you have to go back to what is essentially his era's uh, view on physics and what, what sure. is the motion that 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 does that. And, and a lot of those arguments that are there uh, became the foundations of what later developed into the whole realm of dynamics within physics. So there's, there's a certain sense in which uh, well, I feel like I have to shut off some blinders to, to what I'm attributing to those, those concepts based on a, uh, a non-medieval view of, uh, of, of dynamics and motion. Yes. Um... Uh, he's a Aristotelian about it. Motion is natural pow power hastening towards its end, its end. Um, uh, but he has a whole doctrine of motion, right? A whole doctrine of, 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 of causation. Um, uh, uh, da -da. Okay, if you assign all motion to creatures then and make God free from all motion, are you so slow-witted as to attribute action or reception of action to him from you with, withdraw all motion? For surely before when we were drawing logical conclusions, you wholeheartedly admitted after due consideration, I believe that action and reception of action can be produced only in things in which motion is inherent. Right, so the point is that uh, he's saying if there's, no, if, if there's no change in God, there's no motion in God, therefore there's no action or reception of action in God. That's uh, that's Aristotelian and, and Middle Ages. That's not where we are today. In, in yes, the, but he, the, he he will he will uh, he will go on he will go on to have the notion of this you know this uh, stable or unchanging motion right uh, when he says you know the mind re revolves around the uh, uh, the mind revolves around the idea of God right uh, is meant to be a a motion which is a perpetual motion so to speak or a uh, an unceasing motion so it can be both unchanging and it can be motion. Anyway, you, you, there's, there's all this stuff in there uh, that you can see uh, influence later thinking about uh, 
if I can put this way, actual physics, right? But the, the, the uh, yeah, it, the name of the book is On Nature, right? But what he means by nature is this highest concept or universe, universal that includes both beings and non-beings. And that notion of nature is, it outlives him, so to speak. Um, it's not the notion of just uh, created cosmos. It's the notion of uh, universal. Um, anyway, I, 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 John is a, he's a full, full sort of philosopher and you don't quite get all of him with just his take on negative theology. I think the take on negative theology you get here is, is correct. Um, he talks about you know the divine darkness and all that kind of stuff. There are ways in which he is directly influenced and de dependent upon Dionysus in this. One of the things that's interesting to me about uh, John is that he he long before Aquinas he's wrestling with both Aristotle and Platonism, right? Um, uh, Aristotle he's you know talking about the Aristotelian categories he's uh, talking about the, uh, the, the expressions of emotions, he's fundamentally is a Platonist, not an Aristotelian, but he has a lot of this Aristotelian awareness and understanding that you don't see um, significantly developed in the West, I can put it that way, until Aquinas, or maybe to early beginnings of it in, uh, in some of the Latin uh, of Aroists and, or, uh, or Albert the Great, but really full-blown only in Aquinas. Um, and uh, uh, how about it? There are places where you see elements of Aristotelian epistemolog epistemological sort of concerns in Gregory of Nyssa. Gregory of Nyssa is the kind of person who says, um, how can any uh, uh, finite mind in time understand this eternal thing, right? Which isn't a problem for Arist Aristotelian, would never be a problem for a Platonist. So there's elements of Gregory where his sort of commonsensical Aristotelianism bangs up against his uh, Platonic theology and the common sense wins, right? Not so in Dionysus. Dionysus is completely a Platonist and he's not gonna have any of those Aristotelian concerns. But, but John does, right? John does have all those Aristotelian epistemological concerns and it results in this, both this notion of being that includes something like knowability in a way that heavily influenced Descartes and uh, this uh, resulting notion of, um, there being different perspectival takes on the on on on, on uh, the universal truth from from each mind, because each only gets a a, a cut at it, epistemologically speaking, right? So there's this. Um, he's not simply a uh, Platonic rationalist in that sense. He does think the Platonic rationalism is the truth about the machinery of God behind the world, in the same way that Plato would think his ideas are, right? But he thinks that human knowability of all that is more limited than Plato thinks it is. Um, and that's part, partly Aristotelian influence on it. Anyway, I, I, uh, I feel like we haven't done full justice to, uh, to John, but I don't know that we can. I, I, if you guys have questions about him, I can entertain it that way. Yeah, where, where are you reading from when you, when you just read that last passage? Uh, this is... Uh, John the Scott from the Division of Nature. That's the Paraphysion. Um, this okay. edition, yeah. it, it doesn't actually have the full text. It has a you know, full text of like book one and several of the other books, but some places it has excerpts and paraphrases between, unfortunately. But his main, his more, main work is just um, Paraphysion. Okay, that looked like the best of the best of the available books on, on, on it. Yeah, it, it's not perfect because it's not exhaustive. It doesn't, there are places where it paraphrases and inserts its own you know, understanding of long passages instead of giving you the, in the original, which is not what I prefer, but uh, you know, that's what we have. Well, I, didn't find, I didn't find anything that looked better for under a hundred dollars, so. <laughs> you know, so. In translation, I think that's right. I mean, you can easily find the, 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 the full text on well, easily. You can find the full text in a library in Latin, but uh, if you want it in English, you're going to get something which is going to either um, uh, be secondary or paraphrase at places. Unfortunately, um, good question. Do we want to talk about the cloud of unknowing development and some of the later 
influence of these people? I think we should. Um, I think we talked about it a little bit before, but uh, let's just quickly talk about the, the cloud of annoying position itself, right? So it starts with a division of the different kind of uh, uh, Christian lives into the active and the contemplative. And uh, the active and the contemplative life each have a lower part and a higher part. And the, uh, the, the, the lower part of the uh, Christian active life is concerned with, you know, uh, just materially helping people, right? And, you know, the ex exterior positive action, good works, whatever you want to call it, right? And then the higher part of it consists of the, uh, the active life that is, consists of knowledge of principles and uh, uh, self-mortification and humility and whatever else you would call the intellectual virtue side of, uh, of practical life. And he says, then the, the lower side of the contemplative life is, is equivalent to that, right? The two of them basically coincide, the lower part of the contemplative life and the higher part of the active life. But the higher part of the contemplative life is pure mysticism. It's just to try to know God. <clears throat> and, and this is his explanation of the place of the book itself, right? He's not denying these other aspects of the Christian life exists or that they have, they have value or merit, but the higher part of the mystical life isn't these other things, right? It's its own thing. And he compares it to, uh, citing the New Testament, to Mary's part when Martha objects that, you know, you're not doing anything to help or something. Um, uh, so the, the, the Mary's part is to pay attention only to, only to God. Um, so that's what this is supposed to, supposed to be about. And the, um, there's two fundamental images in it. Um, the cloud of unknowing is, you know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to sit alone, empty your mind of everything else and only think about God. What do you come up with? You come up with a cloud of unknowing, a dark cloud of you don't know. And he says, you, get, you, you, ask, you ask me, what, what, what more can I tell you there? And I says, I have nothing to tell you, right? I, I know nothing, right? You're gonna have to uh, beat your head upon the cloud of unknowing above you, right? But then he uh, brings in the other part of the image, which is the cloud of forgetting. And the cloud of forgetting is what you should put below you to which you should exile every worldly concern, every, every action, every thought, every distracting thought that comes along, right? You should consign them all to the cloud of forgetting, forget about them. They're not important when, we, when you're engaged in this work. And then what do you do with the, uh, with the uh, cloud of the, the, the cloud of unknowing above? And the answer is um, you, you, you try to pierce it with, a, uh, with, with a, uh, an instantaneous burst of love. That's right, what he puts it, right? Uh, the short prayer that pierces heaven, right? This is all meant to be something which, uh, you don't do, but uh, uh, God does for you if you're in, if you're if you're uh, continually petitioning the cloud of unknowing with the with with uh, with love. So this is the way of love aspect of the whole thing. But the the there's this fundamental image of you disappear into inward contemplation. You have unknowability above you. You forget everything that you do know below you. Um, and you remain suspended between the two clouds. You don't know anything of what uh, of the material world that you can know about because you choose to to ignore it as not being important for for the work ahead of you, and you concentrate entirely on the unknow on the unknown and unknowable uh, God above you, and then you essay against it with your desire. Your desire to know is the only thing, which is a longing um, to know God, is what you use to assail the dark cloud of unknowing. Anyway, that's his picture of the higher part of the contemplative life, of the, the mystical path. And all the rest of it is basically um, what you can expect to ha have happen if you, if you do this as a practice in terms of the different distractions that will come upon you and the different psychology of, 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 uh, uh, of it all. Um, and how you know, your wit and your imagination are not aids in this. <laughs> um, a short proof against the error that say that there's no perfecter cause to be meeked under than the knowledge of man's own wretchedness. And, and that there's a fundamental claim here, which is that uh, uh, you don't get true meekness by knowing how low you are, but by knowing how high God is, right? Um, how, knowing how, how, how low you are might, might get you started on the road towards meekness, but that's not real weakness. That's not real meekness. Real meekness begins when you can be as proud of yourself as you like, but you're still humble before the greatness of God. 
right? So anyway, I'm just explaining the kind of stuff you get in a book like this, right? It's, it's mystical practice, self-help fashion of if you're going to actually engage in this contemplative life as a contemplative monk, right? Uh, what do you do? And how do you think about the things that you're doing? Um, anyway, as I say, it's, it's, it's worth reading. It's, you know, 150 pages, something like that, 100 pages. Um, and it's very, the, the language is kind of archaic, so it can be a little bit stilted uh, in the phrasing and so forth. That's the only thing about it that makes it more difficult to comprehend. It's nothing like as philosophically dense or paradoxical as uh, Dionysus or as uh, long and involved and involving as many distinctions as uh, John the Scott. It's easier to read than D, than D in, 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 uh, in terms of the actual um, mm -hmm. content. The language isn't as, as clear, obviously, but if you get through the, the, the unclarity of the language, the thoughts behind it, it's, it's a simpler, more straightforward thing. Um, any questions about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, since you have given us a very nice introduction to it, uh, what do we know about the author and uh, the role of the cloud of unknowing um, in, subsequent Western Christianity and mysticism and negative right. theology? So uh, less than negative theology. Um, uh, it's an anonymous, thought to be 1300s uh, monk. We don't know. Some people think Carth Carth Carthusian, um, but I don't know. Uh, that's just a guess uh, from, from some of the things in it. Um, uh, it's circulated in the Latin West from you know, the 1300s on, it was, you know, quite influential. Um, the, it's, it's usually thought of uh, along with the Dark Knight of the Soul as one of the two principal works of Western mysticism, um, St. John's the Dark Knight of the Soul. Um, and uh, they were, you know, the traditional, put it this way, traditional, not the right word. Uh, if monks wanted a text on what they should do in practice to live a contemplative life, it was the traditional thing that late in time. Um, earlier and in the Eastern church, you might've got John Climacus instead, the latter of divine ascent, I mean, um, which is a longer, more involved work, similar sort of chatty. Um, but uh, in the West, the mystic texts would be the cloud of unknowing and the dark night of the soul. Those would be the main things that people would, would read. Um, and then later, maybe the imitation of Christ. Um, but uh, does that help or? Yes, that, uh, well, for me, that's helpful. Uh, I have, you know, some um, superficial exposure to some of these things. Yeah. Look, um, I am inferring from what you're saying that the uh, focus on uh, essentially negative theology or mysticism has been a fairly persistent thing in Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity. Um, yeah, but let's distinguish those two things, right? I mean, the mystical, the mystical thing is a practice, mm -hmm. right? The, the negative theology is a, is a sort of doctrine and theology and philosophy, semi-philosophical thinking. One inspired the other in the sense that negative theology and Neoplatonism, for that matter, issues in the claim that the final level of approach to or knowledge of or some or experience of God or something like that is a mystical and practical one, not a purely intellectual one, right? That's how one winds up being indebted to the other. But there was mysticism before there was negative theology, right? Um, there's mysticism outside the tradition of negative theology. Um, I think it is fair to say we can tell that many of these mystical traditions are influenced by the conclusion of the negative theology, both in terms of what it says there is to do and in terms of even the terms are being used, right? Whether dark night of the soul or whether the cloud of unknowing, these are terms taken straight from, um, you know, these uh, philosophies or the theologies or metaphysics of uh, uh, something unknowable about God put it that way, um, that leaves a mystical step. In the, in the East, you get this whole tradition of theosis, um, uh, becoming God um, in, in mystical practice, which is how this is thought of. Uh, and that um, 
is directly related to these traditions, directly related to Neoplatonism, um, but it is more sp spoken of in terms of, it's not spoken of in terms of knowing, it's spoken of in terms of unity, right? Um, <clears throat> but uh, I don't know if that, if that helps, but uh, mm -hmm. I don't think all those things are simply negative theology because the mystical traditions, you know, it may get some impetus from, from that. It may get some intellectual heft or gravitas from that, some, you know, background or grounding, but the practices themselves are, you know, their own thing. And people are engaged in them who don't know, uh, uh, have never read Dionysus, for example, right? And have only read these other things. And uh, for instance, whether East or West, um, would you say that um, in a sense, it is the religious, the, mis the monks and the monasteries where uh, these things receive their most serious attention, the most uh, consistent focus. Uh, do these really have an impact on, let's say the everyday life of a Byzantine or of a uh, Roman Catholic? So um, uh, maybe uh, in the Byzantine case, uh, uh, everyday life, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, Obviously, the whole uh, uh, monastic tradition has a giant impact on the everyday life of a, of a Western Christian, right? Um, and you know, why are they supporting monks in the first place? What do they think the monks are doing, right? They think that they are uh, uh, praying to God, praising gods, you know, something like that. And they think that there's something you know uh, uh, that is uh, praiseworthy about a society supporting that activity and about men doing it. Why, right? Um, Lots of reasons may be external, but fundamentally those those end reasons are are, are doctrinal. And uh, the fact that that, that uh, uh, a civilization can see part of its purpose as supporting some human beings engaged in that activity, right? Obviously, has a massive practical importance on the rest of their lives, right? It's in terms of what they're actually going to do, and in terms of how they're oriented, right? What they think they're uh, you know, about, right? Um, if you, if you think the most important thing in life is to, you know, um, have many progeny or, you know, uh, get very rich uh, or, you know, uh, 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 seek the aggrandizement of your fatherland, right? You have a very different uh, attitude towards all the practical aspects of life than if you think the, uh, the purpose of life is to uh, help some human beings to understand or to praise God, right? So obviously the whole reason the Middle Ages are dramatically different from before and after is because that's an orientation of the whole civilization. How much of that is just from these mystical traditions? I don't think all of it, but they, they, certainly, they certainly fed off each other. Um, th there's a, something in the whole, even Platonic tradition, which is already in that direction, um, that a kind of contemplated intellectual piety is the highest uh, human activity is you know an orienting thing for a whole civilization. Um, does that help? Yes, it does. Um, <clears throat> if I can perhaps suggest another um, short journey off into the wilderness. Um, um, as, long, as long as it's not 40 years, we're fine. Well, I, I'm thinking <laughs> specifically of the uh, Carolingian Renaissance, uh, a term from history, yes. um, which you have um, touched on the exteriors of with John of, of Scotland and Ireland. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and the, the birth within the rest of the West, especially France, um, of uh, scholasticism and the university system and um, which is later, that which is later, honestly. No, which is later, which is later, yeah, but yeah. is there a direct connection? Does the Carolinian Renaissance lead to the emergence of the university system and uh, to scholasticism? I don't think so. I think both those things come later. Um, I mean, uh, the University of Paris and, and, and you know, places like Oxford and so forth um, are a few centuries later 
than all that. Um, and it's not just in France. It's not focused just in France. Um, a lot of that is focused on, um, I mean, the, the initial learning involved is uh, definitely focused on, you know, uh, divinity, right? Uh, in, in, in these, if you, if you look around for a doctor, right, in those, those times, your chances are 98 out of 100, you're going to get a doctor of divinity, not, not a doctor of medicine or a doctor of law. Uh, <clears throat> and if you find a doctor of philosophy, that means that you've found the only uh, the only one who knows physics, right? But the uh, in, and and that's you know a percent of a percent or something compared to the doctors of divinity or anything. Like that. Uh, so yeah, yes, that is the original impetus for the schools of learning, no question. Um, uh, scholasticism, as we understand it, as a body of um, philosophy and philosophical thinking about things. Um, definitely grows up in those university settings. That's why they're scholastics. That's why they're schoolmen. Um, and they, the, the, the primary things they're thinking about are philosophy and theology. Um, to a much lesser extent, they're starting to also think about um, some things that we would think of as uh, science of the physical sciences, uh, law, medicine, right? But all of those are poor sisters compared to divinity when the whole university systems get started. Um, I don't know if that helps, but uh, those are going on for hundreds of years before the, the other faculties rise in importance. And they, they get that importance first, first from you know, the other doctorates, the other, uh, the other practical trades, uh, I, I mean, law and medicine and, and, and so forth, um, before they're doing physics. They're all learning logic. They're all learning math. Um, some of them are learning uh, physical sciences and astronomy and so forth. But it's that's a, a minor thing compared to the what we would call the professional schools. Um, there are places where there's overlap. Uh, people like uh, uh, Albert the Great is important for some of the uh, early science thinking. Um, uh, uh, Robert Grosetesta, they, there's a whole investigation where some of these uh, uh, metaphysical concerns and physical investigation overlaps, especially in phenomena of light and optics, right? Uh, you get um, overlap with things like uh, uh, principles of parsimony and explanation. Um, but the real st revolutionary stuff, I think, is people like uh, Roger Bacon um, in that period. And you know how how much is it? Um, some of that is definitely dependent upon the existence of a scholastic tradition and people doing that sort of thing. But uh, I don't think it's any of that becomes actual what we think of as modern science for another couple hundred years. Um, <clears throat> it's not to say that modern science is the only thing that matters in, in universities. Um, but. Scholasticism is about divinity and philosophy for centuries before it's about anything else. Right. And then the transition, as I understand it, is that the Italian, the Renaissance beginning in Italy uh, begins um, a refocus and um, a uh, reinvigoration in different ways that were probably not going to occur in the university system and scholasticism per se. Well, there is some overlap. I mean, it, it happens at courts and it happens at, uh, at universities, both in, in the Italian context and it is also happening at British universities. Um, hmm. So, um, and, you know, uh, certainly all the stuff about logic and stuff was happening at the University of Paris, you know, more than anywhere else. <laughs> um, but, uh, what, what happens between the time of uh, Albert the Great and the time of, say, a Galileo is that you get a, um, an Aristotelianism that becomes entrenched as the school doctrine. Um, and that's more interested in questions of physics and biology than the previous traditions were, but it's also pretty doctrinaire about them. It's, it's not that uh, experimental about them. There have been echo, there have been calls for experimentalism in method before then, people like uh, Roger Bacon, but uh, it really takes off after that um, as a humanist tradition. 
more than anything else. But, but honestly, most of the activity of the humanist isn't focused on science either. It's focused on revival of the classics, um, uh, uh, fi finding and translating Greek texts, um, uh, philosophy before, before Christianity, um, uh, and revival of classics in that sense, uh, and humanism, right? That's the, uh, in, in, in culture and in politics uh, and in art, right? That, that's sort of the main, the main thrust of the Renaissance. Uh, even for the Renaissance, science is an afterthought. It's not the primary focus, in my opinion. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, I want to talk about what we can do. We can do some summing up, but the other thing I want you to think about before you do summing up is what you guys want to do next, right? Because we're at the end of this book um, and we get to pick uh, another topic. And there's, uh, two or three directions we could go with that. Uh, one is there's several things we sort of put on the back burner while we went off on this topic that we could go back to. The other is to maybe some of the people we've come across in all of this that we might want to do deeper dives on. Those are two very different directions. Um, so one of the overall questions is, have people had enough of this line of exploration or do they need to go deeper in part of it? Or do people want to go, go back to something uh, else completely? And if to something else completely, is it back to something that we had back burnered for all this? Um, like some of the Heidegger we were looking at, for example, or is it something entirely new direction uh, uh, instead? Joe has a thought. Uh, I'm interested in a new direction. Yep. Um, something more modern. Yep. Something, something post Kant. Okay. Uh, I'd like to hear what you maybe got on your list of things that we put on the side burner and select among them, perhaps, but uh, for the most part, Return to the to the uh, yep nineteenth twentieth and twentieth centuries. Yep. So so um one thing is when we were looking at Husserl we uh, um, brought up Levinas and there was a possibility of going forward in that direction. I, I will say though that um, we sort of narrowed our focus uh, and we were on Levinas. Um, you know our attendance dropped off to its smallest level in a long time. Right, and I don't know if that's because uh, Levinas is particularly difficult, or people's you know schedules and so forth. But I don't know that I want to explore from the direction that we were on Levinas, just because I think we may lose the entire group. Right, <laughs> no yeah. one may be interested. Right, other than me. Right, uh, the, the other. I, I miss Jim and his daughter. There you go. Uh, the the other the other thing uh, that we had mentioned as leaving behind um, was there were several several things from Heidegger that we had talked about doing uh, along the way. Um, the Parmenides was one we talked about doing, um, which is more about, it's less about Parmenides, it's more about the Greek concept of truth, as Heidegger understands it. Um, there's Plato's Sophist, which is a place where a lot of these um, fundamental concepts of uh, ideas and being, uh, et cetera, in the tradition come up, and this is his attempt to treat it. The downside of this is it's not only a relatively hard book, but it's one of those cases where um, you get long sections of untranslated Greek, right? Uh, than Heidegger's dense gloss on it. So it's, it's relatively challenging. There's also the more approachable, this one, Basic Problems of Phenomenology, which includes a lot of the, uh, a lot of stuff on Kant, honestly, uh, his take on Kant. And, and, uh, it's a more accessible uh, uh, continuation of Heidegger. If we want to do more Heidegger, uh, it's something I would consider doing. Uh, there's also the uh, Introduction to Metaphysics book by Heidegger as another one besides this. Um, but either of those would be, if we wanted to go back to the Heidegger, um, thing, things that I would be perfectly willing to do. Of, of those, my first choice would probably be this one, um, both for depth and for accessibility. I think the Parmenides is in some ways more accessible, not as deep. And I don't mean because of the subject matter, I mean because of the actual treatment he manages to give it. Um, so all of those are in the, in the modern direction, the 20th century direction. Um, things that I would be uh, very open to doing, but I don't know if that's what other people want to do. Um, Chuck. Um, now, given some things in my life, I had to drop out of any active participation. 
do I need to read Being, Being and Time and get a <laughs> crash course somewhere on that before? Not you, for this uh, one. This, 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 this one you can, you can start in uh, alongside Being and Time. I mean, it is a little later, but uh, uh, oh, it's, it's, not, it's not even true. I think it's about just about the same time, just before even. Uh, 1927 was this one. Was on. I think you can start with this one direct. Uh, I've even seen people who read this before Being in Time as a, as a less challenging introduction. Um, but uh, to give you an idea, um, critical phenomenological discussion of some traditional theses about being, starting with Kant's thesis that being is not a real predicate. And then two theses of medieval ontology derived from Aristotle, the constitution of the being of a being, they belong essence and existence. Modern ontology, the basic ways of being are the being of nature and the being of mind or res extensia and res cogitans. That's like Descartes. So the point is, it may be Heidegger, but you're getting Heidegger through the lens of a thesis of Kant, a thesis of Aristotle, a thesis of Descartes, right? You know, relatively approachable moderns, you know, and then more Kant. Uh, more Kant. And then after he's given, you know, uh, and then the thesis of logic that being is the is is of the cupola. After those, he'll sort of give you his own take, right? Um, in like the last quarter of the book, right? Which is kind of an intro to being in time, right? Uh, it's you know not as hard as being in time. So I, I think it's I think it's uh, one reason like I call it accessible is because it has enough reference to. Uh, folks and theses from uh, philosophical tradition that are relatively widely known, not nearly as obscure as some of the people we've been looking at, um, but he's going to use it as an entry point to um, his own, you know, understanding of phenomenology and the problem of being. Joe? Uh, I'm persuaded. I like that book. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear what uh, Craig and Czech think. I think it would be a good idea. Craig, have you read this one? Do you, are you, do you care? I have it, but I haven't read it. Have it, but I haven't read it. That's a very good, good very good sign. It means that you, you think it's worth reading and you still want to read it, so. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think it'd be worth reading. It's also, uh, for those that don't have it, it's, it's under $20 or maybe I think 22 on Prime. So it's, it's, a, it's a available book. Uh, yes. It was one that was on my list and I got overshadowed with a bunch of other stuff. Uh, which uh, I don't think we want to go into necessarily, but that was more of uh, uh, Nikolai Hartman uh, later. Okay, yeah. <laughs> or, but his books are still a hundred bucks a book, so. Yeah, it's a little, a little steep. A little steep, but uh, yeah, I'm good with that. So if we were going to do that, then we would, we would uh, basically read the introduction in part one. So this is the book and the, the introduction is just the outline of the course kind of stuff and his concept of philosophy and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then part one is critical phenomenological discussions and traditional thesis that being, part one, Kant's thesis being it's not a real predicate. So the, the whole thing just takes us through intro and the Kant part. And that winds up being 76 pages. Okay. <clears throat> Does that seem feasible? It's feasible depending on the time. This is the holiday season. Correct. <clears throat> So if we, uh, yeah, fair point. So, um, and you guys have to get the book. Right. So I don't want to try to do this on the on Boxing Day, um, but we could do it the Sunday b before Christmas. The, the, the three coming Sundays, the Sunday before Christmas, which is three weeks from now, that would be my first choice. The Sunday after, right after Christmas, which is literally the day after Christmas. I don't think that's a good idea or the day after New Year's, which I could do if we needed more time. But I don't know if other people are, you know, treat the New Year as uh, being as big a holiday as a uh, Christmas for some. I could do the day after New Year's or I could do the 19th of December. 19th works for me. Joe, is the 19th okay? Uh, yeah, that's probably good. Um... All right. Let's go for the 19th of uh, December and uh, pages. There's, there's gonna be a bunch of translator introduction stuff. Don't worry about that part. Just the part that starts with his own introduction, which should be page one 
uh, through page 76, the end of Kant's thesis, end of chapter one. Okay, I'm having a difficulty finding him. Um, finding the book? Well, I found Heidegger and he's got about 50 titles here. Yeah, and now I'm, the now basic I'm so problems. Lost. You wanna look for the basic problem of phenomenology. Well, now I'm trying to find the search button. <laughs> There you go. I, I think you should find it. Uh, okay. Basic problems. B A S. Sam, are you interested in this one? Um, maybe uh, for checking it out a little. But uh, also quickly, uh, there's another group that will be starting uh, reading of being in time from January fourth. Uh, the Austin Philosophy Discussion Group. I don't know if I mentioned this previously, but yeah. I think you did. Uh, uh, useful, cool. to know, useful to know. Uh, Tuesday is not an easy day for me, but uh, <laughs> well, I uh, but uh, I actually have a question. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the guy who runs that group uh, or that you know subgroup uh, within the larger group. Uh, I mean, uh, is it really oftentimes a good idea to like dive, you know, straight away into the uh, uh, some works that require a bit of background. I find that sometimes, uh, you know, people, even though people claim, oh yeah, I took nine months to read this work with a group, but they really didn't seem to benefit much. Uh, so I'm just curious, <laughs> what are your thoughts on, I mean, some others will, you know, basically be very ad adamant that, oh yeah, you have to read the original work. And it's like, well, uh, uh, well, in the case of in case of being in time, I think it's worth reading the original rather than secondary stuff on it. I think secondary stuff on Heidegger tends to be relatively poor uh, because it either has an inaccurate, shallow take, or because they, uh, you know, have a particular axe to grind. And and uh, it, I think it's better to just take them straight. Um, but uh, in the case of being in time, I mean, we we read it over the course of about a year, so we did take our time. Um, we, we did that, and then we started reading um, volumes three and four of his uh, work on Nietzsche, uh, which we did in another year. Um, so uh, um, if you take it slow enough, I think you can do the original. Um, I think people did get a lot out of it, but it is hard to sustain that level of effort for that length of time. And uh, there's no question that we had a bunch of, if I can put it this way, social floaters who were just in interested in, you know, you know, having something to do on a Saturday afternoon back when we were going to cafes or something who um, uh, dropped out in the course of that. We also had a lot of uh, other people come in um, who were uh, interested in it. Um, in the case of the stuff on Nietzsche, that happened at the time with COVID was also happening. So we went virtual and we had lots of people interested in that one. People came in from, uh, one person came in as far away as Poland. We had a regular person coming in from Seattle and people coming in from the East Coast. Um, so that one was, you know, went quite well, I thought. Um, uh, the being in time was challenging and it was, you know, on and off whether or not we had lots of people. But that was also because we were trying to do the first part of that in person, um, not virtually, which is a challenge in its own right. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's worth trying to read the original um, is my basic answer to the question. Um, I would- well, I mean, sure, you know, I mean, that would be well and good, but uh, if you are just coming, you know, without any background, whatever uh, in that uh, way of thinking, uh, that's what bothers me a little bit. Uh, no, I, I, I get it. And it, uh, Heidegger is something that uh, is better prepared by having some, you know, awareness of, you know, uh, traditional German idealism, some grounding in Nietzsche, et cetera, before him. Um, you can start with uh, introduction to metaphysics or basic problems before being in time if you want to have a easier entree point. Um, uh, but, you know, if you're going to read them, you got to read them at some point. Uh, you, can, you can't prepare forever, right? Um, yeah. uh, so I, you, I could see someone saying, oh, you can't read this book until after you've read the Critique of Pure Reason, you know, uh, uh, cover to cover. And I'm not, <laughs> not going to agree with that, right? You, you, can, you can require too much preparation for something like this. And it's important yeah. enough that I think it's worth, you don't have to have read every work he's going to cite. Um, just as when we did the, the, this, you know, you could say, do you want to do this, uh, the Unknown God book, uh, and have to have read um, uh, all of Plotinus and all of Proclus and... Uh, no, you know, you don't have to have done all that, but it helps to have someone leading discussion who's read a fair amount of it. 
Um, right. Right. Cool. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Fair, fine question. Um, so uh, I think we're we're we've settled on what we want to do next. I wanted to give people a chance to give wrap up thoughts on the whole uh, uh, D book before we leave it. Um, there's there's one uh, one sentence at the end of the book that uh, that really struck me as as kind of odd uh, on page three twenty five. Um, I get it real quick. Um, from an apophatic viewpoint, the only way to cross the distance that is seen to exist between the soul and the one, between the soul and God, is the breakdown and negation of all normal epistemological categories of subject and object, which are, of course, the basis for all cognition. And when I read that, I thought, uh, she hasn't been... Uh, uh, taught anything about modern physics yet. <laughs> yes, I don't think that it is true that uh, everyone agrees that uh, uh, subject and object as normal uh, plus categories are the basis for all cognition. Uh, I think yeah, you, you're fair, fair to call that out. I also think that um, the categories of subject and object were practically never mentioned in this book. Exactly. Right? They, they, actually, they actually do come up a little bit in Gregory and in uh, uh, John Scotus, but for everyone before then, um, uh, they wouldn't even use the term soul here. I mean, she, she's using the term soul here as though it means uh, something like modern mind uh, in the Cartesian sense. And that's not the way the Platonists were using it. To them, soul is a term of art and soul and mind are two different things. There's nous and there's psyche, 2K. Um, and uh, uh, soul is a structure of drives that's lower than mind, right? She, she, she doesn't use these terms in their ancient technical sense when she's talking about an ancient topic. She used them in a modern in a modern colloquial sense that she thinks is a man on the street sense that she thinks everyone is going to agree with. Um, and that can get her into trouble. I mean, you know, here the people who think that the basic epistemological categories are subject and object are ba that's basically limited to the period from Kant to like modern uh, subjectivism or modern uh, um, uh, relativism, right, in the like first half of the 20th century or something. That's the entire period in which that's the, that's the, the, the main problematic. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, yeah, fair. Yeah, the only um, other one I, I noticed on 324 that I got a kick out of was uh, um, uh, that Nicholas of Cusa remarked that the works of er Ergina and Eckhart should never have been given to the weak-eyed ones who would misunderstand them. The elitism came back in again. Uh, Yes, absolutely. I mean, so, part part of that is that, uh, especially in the case of some of these mystical uh, religious traditions, they were thought of as actually dangerous to faith, right? Uh, they, you know, someone would uh, read uh, uh, Scottish Eurigena and uh, you know hear the pantheist notes and become completely religious. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of what Nicholas is talking about there, um, uh, but. You also have to also understand that that's partly self-defense. Um, you don't want to be accused by the hierarchy of corrupting the youth. So you say, this isn't for the youth. This is for mature monks. And if someone other than mature monks is reading it and being harmed by it, it's not our fault, right? So there's an element of self-defense in, in, in that. It's not simply elitism in a sneering sense. It's also self-defense of a, you know, don't condemn us if somebody read us the wrong way, it's on them. And then the, the last uh, last comment I had on all this is, uh, as we've glanced through some of the mystical tradition and all that kind of stuff, the one person that, that uh, never seemed to come up was Hildegard. Fair. And I was curious if there's a, a, a reason for that, if you just too- I, 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 Other than it's just a hole in my own, uh, my own, my own knowledge. Uh, I, I'm familiar with most of these other people, but not there, so. Yeah, and I noticed that, that she didn't bring him bring her up either in any she'll mention Icar Meister and uh yes. you know this, but she never mentioned Hildegard either. Nope. Uh I mean there's others like uh, uh Saint Teresa of Avila is not mentioned, but that's probably later. But um yeah. uh I mean there are there are other people in the mystical traditions, but uh I think for the main line of the influence of Dionysus, uh uh Eckhart and uh well, first Scotus, but uh, uh, then then Eckhart and Nicholas of Cusa are probably the main line of that influence. 
Um, it's not because there aren't other mystics of importance. You could also just talk about the, uh, the Kabbalah tradition or something. Um, but uh, she's trying to focus on, even the ones she mentions are the people who are beyond her, her range that she thinks are, you know, they're not in her dissertation because they're outside of her temporal time window, right? Uh, because, you know, anything scholastic or high middle ages is outside her time window. She's trying to do ancients to dark ages. But by the time she gets to Aquinas, it's, it's a whole other world and she doesn't want to try to take it on in the same, in the same chomp. <coughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Don't get the sense in anything that she ever takes on Aquinas. Just uh, the only other book she's written is the uh, is the taking John's Goddess further book. Yeah, fair. I mean, I, I think that she. I mean, she went on to become like a university administrator and a practical doer of good works kind of person, rather than a uh, a philosopher, right? Um, it's not because she doesn't have you know wide learning. She's a scholar, but. Um, it's sort of not her point or purpose in life to uh, either write history or write original philosophy, right? Um, this was, you know, it's, it's a grounding in the subjects of her of her own interest, but then she went off to, you know, practically teach. And, you know, that's what her actual calling is, I think. Okay, of course, uh, having been an academic uh, uh, university administrator and practical uh, are kind of no, 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 she's no. she's she, she's she's a university administrator, not at a major West Mid, Midwestern university, but uh, in a in a, uh, a Catholic university in Africa, right? So <laughs> she's she's yeah. doing yeah, I'm just making a joke about that. Uh, semi semi missionary uh, uh, academic work, if I can put it that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but fair fair, fair question. Um, all right, uh, I think that's good enough on on D, unless other people have final thoughts. I mean, overall, I found her a capable guide. I think the people she talks about are um, deeper and in some ways more interesting than she is, but she brought a perfectly mm -hmm. useful perspective to it, a perfectly good slice through all of it. It would have been impossible to uh, drink the ocean of all these people in this whole tradition without the kind of limiting lens of you know the one topic she focused on. Um, and I think it was a very good uh, follow on to the Gnostics, we could easily get the sense that the Gnostics were the only place where this sort of thinking was going on and to see instead that there's a uh, a more mainline version of, of all this. Um, it wasn't as peripheral as the Gnostics, but uh, actually influenced the, you know, some of the major traditions of, of Western theology. Um, that's sort of the reason why I wanted to do this after, after the previous work on, on Gnosticism. Um, all right. Uh, and of course, I'm always interested in it because anything that was influenced of Platonism, I'm interested in. <laughs> um, but uh, all right, so uh, for, for next time, uh, December 19th, uh, Martin Heidegger, Basic Problems of Phenomenology, Introduction and through part one. And uh, we'll uh, hope to see, see many of you again, again then. And uh, we'll see if some of our others manage to come back for this. All right, uh, I'm going to stop recording. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank thanks. You. Bye bye.